The lopsided helix shape of the seed pod hovered a meter and a half in front of Mara, practically daring her to strike it down. Shied it darkly. Skywalker's lightsaber held ready in an unorthodox but versatile two-handed grip. She'd already missed the pod twice. She didn't intend to do so a third time. Don't rush it, Skywalker cautioned her. Concentrate. And let the force flow into you. Try to anticipate the pod's motion. Easy for him to say, she thought sourly. After all, he was the one controlling it. The pod twitched a millimetre closer, daring her again, and suddenly she decided she was tired of this game. Reaching out with the force, she got a grip of her own on the pod. Briefly immobilised, it managed a single trem before she jabbed the lightsaber straight out, stabbing it nearly dead centre. There, she said, closing down the weapon. I did it. She'd expected Skywalker to be angry. To her mild surprise, and not so mild annoyance, he wasn't in the least. Good, he said encouragingly. Very good. It's difficult to split your attention between two separate mental and physical activities that way. And you did it well. Thanks, she muttered, tossing the lightsaber away from her toward the bushes. Curved smoothly round in midair, Skywalker pulled it back to land in his outstretched hand. So is that it? she added. Skywalker looked over his shoulder. Sol and Calrissian were hunched over the protocol droid, which had stopped complaining about Wayland's terrain, vegetation, and animal life, and was instead complaining about what crunching through that stone crust had done to its foot. Skywalker's astronaut droid was hovering nearby with its sensor antenna extended, running through its usual repertoire of encouraging noises. A couple of steps away, the Wookiee was rummaging through one of their packs, probably for some tool or other. I think we've got time for a few more exercises, Skywalker decided, turning back to face her. That technique of yours is very interesting. Obi-Wan never taught me anything about using the tip of the lightsaber blade. The Emperor's philosophy was to use everything you had available, Mara said. Somehow that doesn't surprise me, Skywalker said dryly. He held out the lightsaber. Let's try something else. Go ahead and take the lightsaber. Reaching out of the force, Mara snatched it away from his loose grip, wondering idly what he would do if she tried some time to ignite the weapon first. She wasn't sure she could handle anything as small as a switch, but it'd be worth trying just to see him scramble away from the blade. And if in the process she happened to accidentally kill him, you will kill Luke Skywalker. She squeezed the lightsaber hard. Not yet. She told the voice firmly. I still need him. All right, she growled. What now? He didn't get a chance to answer. Behind him, the astromech droid suddenly started squealing excitedly. What? Solo demanded, his blaster already out of its holster. He says he's just noticed something worth investigating there to the side. The protocol droid translated, gesturing to his left. A group of vines, I believe he's saying. Though I could be mistaken, with all the acid damage. Come on, Chewie, let's check it out. Solo cut him off, getting to his feet and starting up the shallow slope of the creek bed. Skywalker caught Mara's eye. Come on, he said, and started off after them. It wasn't very far to go. Just inside the first row of trees, hidden from view by a bush, was another set of vines like the ones we had to occasionally cut through the last couple of days. Except that this group had already been cut. Cut and then bunched up out of the way like a pile of thick, tangled rope. I think that ends any discussion as to whether someone out there is helping us along. Calrissian said, studying one of the cut ends. I think you're right, Solo said. No predator would have bunched them up like this. The Wookiee rumbled something under his breath and pulled on the bush in front of the vines. To Mara's surprise, it came away from the ground without any effort at all, and wouldn't have bothered with camouflage either, Calrissian said as the Wookiee turned it over. Knife cut, looks like. Just like the vines. And like the claw bird from yesterday, Solo agreed grimly. Luke, we've been getting company? I've sent some of the natives, Skywalker said, but they never seem to come very close before they leave again. He looked back down the slope at the protocol droid, waiting anxiously for them in the creek bed. You suppose it has anything to do with the droids? Solo snorted. You mean like on Endor when those fuzzball Ewoks fought Freepio as a god? Something like that, Skywalker nodded. They could be getting close enough to hear fr either Freepio or R2. Maybe, Solo looked around. When do they come around? Mostly around sundown, Skywalker said. So far, anyway. Well, next time they do, let me know, Solo said jamming his blaster back into its holster and starting back down the slope toward the creek bed. It's about time we all had a little chat together. Come on, let's get moving. The darkness was growing thicker, and the camp nearly put together for the night. Neatly put together, nearly put together for the night, when the wisps of sensation came. Han, Luke called softly, they're here. Han nodded, tapping Lando on the back as he drew his blaster. How many? Luke focused his mind, working at separating the distinct parts out of the overall sensation. Looks like five or six of them coming in from that direction. He pointed to the side. Is that just in the first group? 
Mara asked. First group, Luke frowned, letting his focus open up again. She was right. There was a second group coming up behind the first. That's just the first group, he confirmed. Second group? I get five or six there, too. I'm not sure. But they might be a different species from the first. Han looked at Lando. What do you think? I don't like it, Lando said, fingering his blaster uneasily. Mara, how well do these species usually get along? Not all that well, she said. There was some trade and other stuff going on when I was here, but there were also stories about long freeway wars between them and the human colonists. Chewbacca growled a suggestion that the aliens might be joining forces against them. That's a fun thought, Han said. How about it, Luke? Luke strained, but it was no use. Sorry, he said. There's plenty of emotion there, but I don't have any basis for figuring out what kind. They've stopped, Mara said, her face tight with concentration. Both groups. Han grimaced. I guess this is it. Lando, Mara, you stay here and guard the camp. Luke, Chewie, let's go check him out. They headed up the rocky slope and into the forest, moving as quietly as possible among the bushes and dead leaves underfoot. They know we're coming yet? Han muttered over his shoulder. Luke stretched out with the force. I can't tell, he said, but they don't seem to be coming any closer. Chewbacca rumbled something Luke didn't catch. Could be, Han said. It'd be pretty stupid to hold the Council of Ward this close to their target, though. And then, ahead and to their left, Luke caught a shadowy movement beside a thick tree trunk. Watch it, he warned, his lightsaber igniting with a snap hiss. In the green-white light from the blade, a small figure in a tight fitting hooded garment could be seen as it ducked back behind the trunk, barely getting out of the way as Han's quick shot blew a sizable pit in one side of the trunk. Chewbacca's bowcaster bolt was a split second behind Han's, gouging out a section of the trunk on the other side. Through the erupting cloud of smoke and splinters, the figure could be seen briefly as it darted from the rapidly decreasing cover of its chosen tree toward another, thicker trunk. Even as Han swung his blaster to track it, a strange warbling split the air, sounding like a dozen alien birds. And with a roar that was part recognition, part understanding, and part relief, Chewbacca swung the end of his bowcaster into Han's blaster, sending the shot wide of his intended target. Chewie! Han barked. No, he's right! Luke cut him off. Suddenly it had all come together for him too. You! Stop! The order was unnecessary. The shadowy figure had already come to a halt, standing unprotected in the open, its hooded face shaded from the faint light of Luke's lightsaber. Luke took a step toward it. I'm Luke Skywalker, he said formally. Brother of Leo Solo, son of the Lord Darth Vader. Who are you? I am Urkrikor Clan Baktor, the gravelly Nograi voice replied. I greet you, son of Vader. The clearing... Ekrikor led them to was close, only twenty meters or so further along the vector Luke had started them on in the first place. The aliens are there all right, two different types, five of each standing on the far side of a thick fallen tree trunk. On the near side stood two more Nograi in those camouflaged outfits of theirs with the hoods thrown back. Propped up on a log between the two sides was some sort of compact work light, giving off just enough of a glow for Han to pick up the details of the nearest aliens. It wasn't very encouraging. The group on the right were a head taller than the Nograi facing them and maybe a head shorter than Han. Covered with lumpy plates, they looked more like walking rock piles than anything else. The group on the left were nearly as tall as Chewbacca, with four arms each and a shiny bluish crystal skin that reminded Han of the brownish thing that had to shoot off Free Pier their first day here. Friendly looking bunch, he muttered to Luke as their group moved toward the last line of trees between them and the clearing. They are the Mainerishi and Pasadans, Erkrikor said. They have been seeking to confront you. And you've been driving them off? Luke asked. They sought to confront, the Nograi repeated. We could not permit that. They stopped just inside the clearing. A rustle ran through the aliens, one that didn't sound all that friendly. I get the feeling we aren't all that welcome, Han said. Luke? Beside him, he felt Luke shake his head. I still can't read anything solid, he said. What's this all about, Eric Rikor? They have indicated they wish a conversation with us, the Nograi said perhaps to decide whether they will seek to give us battle. Han gave the aliens a quick once-over. They all seemed to be wearing knives, and there were a couple of bows in evidence, but he didn't see anything more advanced. They better hope they brought an army with them, he said. We don't want to fight at all if we can avoid it, Luke proved him mildly. How are you going to communicate with them? One of them learned a little of the Emperor's basic when the storehouse was being built beneath the mountain, Ekrikor said, pointing to the Maynerish standing closest to the work light. He will attempt to translate. You might be able to do a little better. Luke raised his eyebrows at Han. What do you think? It's worth a try? Han agreed, pulling out his comlink. It's about time for EPO and his keep anyway. Lando? Right here. Lando's voice came instantly. You find the aliens? Yeah, we found them, Han said. Plus a surprise or two. Have Mara bring Freepio here. If she heads out the way... 
we went, she ran in right into us. Got it, Lando said. What about me? I don't think this bunch will give us any trouble, Han said, giving the aliens another once over. You and R2 might as well stay there and keep an eye on the camp. Oh, and if you see some short guys with camouflage suits and lots of teeth, don't shoot. They're on our side. I'm glad, Lando said dryly. I think. Anything else? Han looked at the groups of shadowy aliens, all of them staring straight back at him. Yeah, cross your fingers. We might be able to pick up some allies. We're also a whole lot of trouble down the road. Right, Mara and Freepio are on their way. Good luck. Thanks. Shutting off the comm link, Han returned it to his belt. They're coming, he told Luke. There is no need for them to guard your camp, Herc Rikor said. The Nograi will protect it. That's okay, Han said. It's getting crowded enough here as it is. He eyed Ekrikor. So I was right. We were followed in. Yes, Ekrikor said, bowing his head. And for that deception I beg your forgiveness, consort of the Lady Vader. I and others did not feel it entirely honourable, but Kakmaim clan Aikmir wished our presence to be kept hidden from you. Why? Ekrikor bowed again. Kakmaim clan Aikmir felt hostility from you in the Lady Vader's suite, he said. He believed you would not willingly accept the guard of Nograi to accompany you. Han looked at Luke, caught the kids halfway tried, hiding a grin. Well, next time you see Karkmaim, you tell him that I stopped passing up free help years ago, he told Ekrikor. But as long as we're discussing hostility, you can knock off that consort of the Lady Vader stuff. Call me Han, or Solo, or Captain, or practically anything else. Han Clan Solo, maybe, Luke murmured. Ekrikor brightened. That is good, he said. We beg your forgiveness, Han Clan Solo. Han looked at Luke. I think you've been adopted, Luke said, fighting that grin again. Yeah, Han said. Thanks. A lot. A little rapport never hurts, Luke pointed out. Remember Endor? I'm not likely to forget, Han growled, feeling his lip twist. Sure of little fuzzballs had, a, they had done their bit in that final battle against the second Death Star. That didn't change the fact that being made part of an Ewok tribe was one of the more ridiculous things he'd ever had to go through. Still, the Ewoks had overwhelmed the Imperial troops by sheer weight of numbers. The Nograi, on the other hand. How many of you are there here? He asked Herkrikor. There are eight, the other replied. Two each have travelled before, after, and on either side of you during your journey. Han nodded, feeling a grudging trickle of unwilling respect for these things. Eight of them, silently killing or driving away predators and natives, day and night both, and still finding time on top of it to clear their path of nuisances like clawbirds and vine snakes. He looked down at er Ekrikor. No, the adoption process didn't feel quite so ridiculous this time around. From somewhere behind them came a familiar shuffling sound. Han turned, and a moment later the equally familiar golden figure of Freepio traipsed tra 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 into view. Beside him and a half step behind was Mara, blaster in hand. Master Luke, Freepio called his voice its usual mixture of relieved and anxious and just plain prissy. Over here, Freepio, Luke called back. Thank you. Think you can do some translation for us? I'll do my best, the droid said. As you know, I am fluent in over six million forms of communique. I see you found the natives. Mara cut him off, giving the group by the log a quick survey as she and Freepio stepped into the clearing. Her eyes fell on Ekrikor. And a little surprise, too, she added her blaster quietly, shifting its aim toward the Nograi. It's all right. He's a friend, Luke assured her, reaching toward her blaster. I don't think so, Mara said, twitching the weapon to the side, out of reach. They're Nograi. They work for Fraun. We serve him no longer, Ekrikor told her. That's true, Mara. They don't, Luke said. Maybe, Mara said. She still wasn't happy about it, but at least her blaster wasn't pointed exactly at Ekrikor anymore. Across the clearing, the main nearish nearest the log, pulled what seemed to be a bleached white stuffed claw bird from a shoulder pouch. Speaking inaudibly under his breath, he laid it in front of him beside the work light. What's that? Han asked. Lunch? It is called the Satna Chaka, Ekrikor said. It is a bond of peace while this meeting lasts. They are ready to begin. You, Freepio droid, come with me. Of course, Freepio said, not sounding exactly thrilled by the whole arrangement. Master Luke? I'll come with you, Luke soothed. Han, Chewie, you stay here. No argument from me, Han said. For clearly reluctant Freepio in tow, Luke and the Nogra headed toward the log. The head, Minerish, raised its upper two hands over his head, palm inwards. Bidaisi Chara, he said, his voice surprisingly melodious. Laonu Baema Duknu Fairy. He announces the arrival of the strangers. 
Freepio said precisely. Presumably that refers to us. He fears, however, that we will bring danger and trouble again to his people. Beside Han Chewbacca, rumbled a sarcastic comment. No, but not much for small talk, Han agreed. Not much for diplomacy, either. We bring hope to your people, the Chief Nograi countered. If you let us pass, we will free you from the domination of the Empire. Freepio translated the melodious Minerishi words still coming out prissy in Han's opinion. One of the lumpy Sardans made a chopping gesture and said something that sounded like a faint and distant scream with consonants scattered around in it. He says that the Sardan people have long memories, Freepio translated. Apparently deliverers have come before, but nothing has ever changed. Welcome to the real world, Han muttered. Luke threw a look at him over his shoulder. Ask him to explain, Freepio, he told the droid. Freepio complied, quiet screaming back at the Sardan and then throwing in a Minerishi translation too, just to show he could do it. The Sardan's answer went on for several minutes and Han's ears were starting to hurt by the time he was done. Well, Freepio said, tilting his head and settling into the professor mode Han had always hated. There are many details, but I will pass those by for now, he added hastily, probably at a look from one of the Nograi. The humans who came as colonists were the first invaders. They drove the native peoples from some of their lands and were stopped only when their lightning bows and metal birds, those are their terms of course, began to fail. Much later came the Empire, who, as we know, built into the Forbidden Mountain. They enslaved many of the native peoples to help on the project and drove others from their lands. After the builders left came someone who called himself the Guardian, and he too saw control over the native peoples. Finally, the one who called himself the Jedi Master came, and in a battle that lit up the sky he defeated the Guardian. For a time the native peoples thought they might be freed, but the Jedi Master brought humans and native peoples to himself and forced them to live together beneath the shadow of the Forbidden Mountain. Finally, the Empire has returned. Freepio tilted his head back again. As you can see, Master Luke, we are merely the last in a long line of invaders. Except that we're not invaders, Luke said. We're here to free them from the rule of the Empire. I understand that, Master Luke. I know you do, Luke interrupted the droid. Tell them that. Oh, yes, of course. He started into this translation. You ask me, I don't think they've had it all that bad, Han muttered to Chewbacca. The Empire took whole planets away from some people. Primitives always have this reaction to visitors, Mara said. They usually have long memories, too. Yeah, maybe. Suppose that Jedi Master they were talking about was your pal Zaveoff? Who else? Mara said grimly. This must be where Ferron found him. Han felt his stomach tighten. You think he's here now? I don't sense anything, Mara said slowly. Doesn't mean he can't come back. The head, Minerish, was talking again. Han let his gaze drift around the clearing. Were there other... Minerishi and Sardan's out there keeping an eye on the big debate. Luke hadn't said anything about backups, but they'd have to be crazy not to have them somewhere nearby. Unless Ekrikor's pals had already taken care of them, if this didn't work, it could turn out to be handy having the Nograi around. The Minerish finished its speech. I'm sorry, Master Luke, Freepio apologized. They say they have no reason to assume we are any different from all those they have already spoken of. I understand their fears, Luke nodded. Ask them how we can prove our good intentions. Creepio started to translate, and as he did so, a hard wookie elbow jabbed into Han's shoulder. What? Han asked. Chewbacca nodded toward his left, his bowcaster already up and tracking. Han followed the movement of his eyes. Uh-oh. What is it? Mara demanded. Han opened his mouth. Then suddenly there wasn't time to tell her. The wiry predator Chewbacca had spotted, slinking through the tree branches, had stopped slinking and was coiling itself to spring at the discussion group. Look out! He snapped instead bringing his blaster up. Chewbacca was fast. With Wookiee Hunter's roar, he fired the bowcaster bolt, slicing the predator nearly in half. Fell off its perch, crunching into the dead leaves, and lay still. And over by the log, the whole group of Minerishi snarled. Watch it, Chewie, Han warned, shifting his aim toward the aliens. That might have been a mistake, Mara said tensely. You're not supposed to fire weapons at a truce conference. You're not supposed to let the conference get eaten, either, Han retorted. Beside the Minerishi, the five Sardans had started to shake, and he hoped... Ekrikor's pals had the rest of the area covered. Freepio, tell them. Certainly, Captain Solo. Freepio said, it sounding about as nervous as Han felt. Molansa, the head. Maynarash cut him off with a chopping motion of his two left arms. You, he wobbled in passable basic, jabbing all four hands at Han. He have lightning bow? Han frowned at him. Of course, Chewbacca had a weapon. So did all the rest of them. He glanced up at the Wookiee. Suddenly, he understood. Yes, he has, he told the... Minerish, lowering his blaster. He's our friend. We don't keep slaves like the Empire did. Freepio started into his translation. 
but the main area she was already jabbering away to his friends. Nice work, Mara murmured. I hadn't thought of that. But you're white. The last Wookiees they saw here would have been Imperial slaves. Han nodded. Let's hope it makes a difference. The discussion ran on for a few more minutes, mostly between the main Erishi and the Saturns. Fipio tried for a while to keep up a running translation, but it quickly degenerated into not much more than a reporting of the highlights. The main Erishi, apparently, were starting to think this was their chance to get rid of the oppression of first the Empire and then the Jedi Master himself. The Saturns didn't like the Imperials any more than the main Erishi, but the thought of facing up to Zabayoff was making them skittish. We aren't asking you to fight alongside us, Luke told them when he was finally able to get their attention back. Our battle is our own, and we will handle it ourselves. All we ask is your permission to travel through your territory to the Forbidden Mountain, and your assurance that you won't betray us to the Empire. Freepio did his double translation, and Han braced himself for another argument, but there wasn't one. The head, Minerish, raised his upper hands again, and with his lower hands picked up the bleached claw bird and offered it to Luke. I believe he is offering you safe conduct, Master Luke. Freepio said helpfully, though I could be wrong. Their dialect has survived relatively intact, but just as the movements are often, tell him thank you, Luke said, nodding as he accepted the claw bird, tell him we accept their hospitality, and that they won't be sorry they helped us. General Covell, the militarily precise voice came over the intercom from the shuttle cockpit. We should be on the surface in just a few more minutes. Acknowledged, Covell said. He keyed the intercom off and turned to the shuttle's only other passenger. We're almost there, he said. Yes, I heard. Sabao said, his amusement echoing through his voice and through Covell's mind. Tell me, General Covell, are we at the end of our voyage or at the beginning? The beginning, of course, Covell told him. The voyage we have set upon will have no end. And what of Grand Admiral Thrawn? Covell felt a frown crease his forehead. He hadn't heard this question before, at least not said this particular way, but even as he hesitated, the answer came soothingly into his thoughts, as all answers did now. It's the beginning of Grand Admiral Thrawn's ending. He said. Sabaoth laughed softly, the amusement rippling pleasantly through Covell's mind. Covell thought about asking what was funny, but it was easier and far more agreeable to just sit back and enjoy the laughter. And anyway, he knew perfectly well what it was that was funny. You do, don't you? Sabaoth agreed, shaking his head. Ah, General, General. It's so very ironic, isn't it? From the very beginning, from that very first meeting in my city, Grand Admiral Fraunus had the answer within his grasp, and yet even now he is as far from understanding as he was then. Is it about power, Master Sabaoth? Kavil asked. This was a familiar topic, and even without the prompting in his mind he would have remembered his lines. It is indeed, General Kavil, Sabaoth said gravely. I told him at the very beginning that true power didn't lie in the conquering of distant worlds, or in battles and war and the crushing of faceless rebellions. He smiled, his eyes glittering bright in Kavil's mind. No, General Covell, he said softly. This, this is true power. Holding another's life in the palm of your hand. Having the power to choose his path and his thoughts and his feelings. To rule his life and decree his death. Slowly, theatrically, Sabaoth held out his hand, palm upward, to command his soul. Something not even the Emperor ever understood, Covell reminded him. Another ripple of pleasure rolled through Covell's mind. It was so satisfying to see the Master enjoying his game. Not even the Emperor, Sabaoth agreed, his eyes and thoughts drifting far away. He, like the Grand Admiral, saw power only as how far outside himself he could reach, and it destroyed him, as I could have told him it would. For if he'd truly commanded Vader, he shook his head. In many ways he was a fool, but perhaps it was not his destiny to be otherwise. Perhaps it was the will of the universe that I, and I alone, would understand. For only I have both the strength and the will to grasp hold of this power. The first, but not the last. Carvel nodded, swallowing against a dry throat. It was not pleasant when Zabaoth left him like this, even for a little bit, especially not when there was this strange loneliness along with it. But of course the master knew that. Do you ache with my loneliness, General Carvel? He said, warming Carvel's mind with another smile. Yes, of course you do, but be patient. The time is coming when we shall be many. And when that time is here, we will never be lonely again. Observe. He felt the distant sense as he did all others now, filtered and focused and structured through the master's perfect mind. You see, I was right, Sabaoth said, reaching out to examine that sense. They are here, Skywalker and Jade both. He smiled at Covell. They will be the first, General Covell, the first of our many. For they will come to me, and when I have shown to them the true power, they will understand and will join us. 
His eyes drifted away again. Jade will be the first, I think, he added thoughtfully. Skywalker has resisted once, and will resist again, but the key to his soul is even now waiting for me in the mountain below. But Jade is another matter. I have seen her in my meditations, have seen her coming to me and kneeling at my feet. She will be mine and Skywalker will follow, one way or another. He smiled again. Covel smiled back, pleased at the master's own pleasure and by the thought of others who would be there to warm his mind. And then, without any warning, it all went dark. Not loneliness, not the way it had been, but a sort of emptiness. By and by, he felt his head being roughly lifted by his chin. Sabaoth was there, in a way, staring into his eyes. General Covel! The master's voice thundered. Thundered strangely, too. Covel could hear it, but it wasn't really there. Not like it should have been. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Covel said. His own voice sounded strange, too. He looked past the bow's face to the interesting pattern of lines on the shuttle bulkhead. He felt himself being shaken. Look at me, Sabaoth demanded. Covel did so. That was odd, too, because he could see the master, but he wasn't really there. Are you still there? The master's face changed. Something. Was it called a smile? Came across it. Yes, General. I am here. The distant voice said, I no longer touch your mind, but I am still your master. You will continue to obey me. Obey. An odd concept, Covel thought. Not like simply doing what was natural. Obey? You will do as I tell you, Sabaoth said. I will give you things to say and you will repeat every word. All right, Covel said. If you do that, will you come back? I will, the master promised. Despite Grand Admiral Thrawn's treachery, if you're obedient, if you're doing what I tell you, we will together destroy his betrayal of us. And then we will never be apart again. The emptiness will be gone? Yes, but only if you do what I say. The other men came a little later. The master stayed at his side the whole time, and he said all the words the master told him to say. They all went somewhere, and then the men left, and the master left too. He stared off across the place they'd left him in, watching the patterns of lines and listening to the emptiness all around him. Eventually he fell asleep. A strange sort of bird call warbled off in the distance, and instantly the background crackle of insects and scuttling animals ceased. But apparently there was no immediate danger, and a minute later the nighttime sounds and activity resumed. Shifting her position against her chosen tree trunk, Mara eased her aching back muscles and wished this whole thing was over. There is no need for you to stay awake, a soft nor gry voice said at her shoulder. We will guard. Thanks, Mara said shortly. If it's all the same to you, I'll do my job. But Nograi was silent for a moment. You still do not trust us, do you? Actually, she hadn't thought all that much about it one way or the other. Skywalker trusts you, she said. Isn't that good enough? It is not approval we seek, the Nograi told her. Only the chance to repay our debt. She shrugged. They'd protected the camp. They'd tackled the always tricky job of first contact of the Maynerishi and Sardans. And now here they were protecting the camp again. If it's a debt to the New Republic... I'd say you're doing a pretty good job of it, she conceded. You finally figured out Fraun and the Empire had been stringing you along? There was a quiet click, like needle teeth coming together. You knew about that? I heard rumours, Mara said, recognising how potentially dangerous this ground was, but not really caring. More like jokes, really. I never knew how much of it was true. Most likely all of it, the Nograi said calmly. Yes, I can see how our lives and deaths could be amusing to our enslavers. We will convince them otherwise. Not white hot rage, no fanatical hatred. Just a simple icy determination, about as dangerous as you could get. How are you going to do that? she asked. When the time is right, the Nograi will turn upon their enslavers. Some of Imperial worlds, someone transporting ships, and five groups will come here. Mara frowned. You knew about Wayland? Not until you let us here, the other said. But we know now. We have sent the location to those waiting at Coruscant. By now they will have passed the word on to others. Mara snorted quietly. You have a lot of confidence in us, don't you? Our missions complement each other, but Nograi assured her, his gravelly mewing somehow sounding grimmer. You have set for yourselves the task of destroying the cloning facility. With the help of the son of Vader, we do not doubt you will succeed. For ourselves, the Nograi have chosen the task of eliminating every last reminder of the Emperor's presence on Wayland. Probably the last relics of the Emperor's presence anywhere. Mara turned that idea over in her mind, wondering why it didn't seem to grieve or anger her. Probably she was just tired. Sounds like a big project, she said instead. Who is the son of Vader you're expecting to show up and help us? There was a brief silence. The son of Vader is already with you, the Nograi said, sounding puzzled. You serve him, as do we. Mara stared at him through the darkness, and suddenly her heart seemed to freeze in her chest. You mean, Skywalker? You did not know? Mara turned away from him, staring down at the sleeping form no more than a metre away from her feet, a horrible numbness flooding through her. 
Suddenly, finally, all these years, the last elusive piece had fallen into place. The Emperor didn't want her to kill Skywalker for his own sake. It was instead one final act of vengeance against his father. You will kill Luke Skywalker. And in the space of a few heartbeats, everything Mara had believed about herself, her hatred, her mission, her entire life, had turned from certainty to confusion. You will kill Luke Skywalker. You will kill Luke Skywalker. You will kill Luke Skywalker. No, she muttered at the voice through clenched teeth. Not like that. My decision. My reasons. But the voice continued unabated. Perhaps it was her resistance and defiance fueling it now. Or perhaps the deeper power and the force that Skywalker had given her over the past few days had made her more receptive to it. You will kill Luke Skywalker. You will kill Luke Skywalker. But you are another matter, Mara Jade. Mara jerked, a sudden motion banging the back of her head against the tree trunk behind her. Another voice, but this one wasn't coming from inside her. It was coming from... I have seen you in my meditations, the voice continued placidly. I have seen you coming to me and kneeling at my feet. You will be mine, and Skywalker will follow, one way or another. Mara shook her head violently, trying to shake away the words and thoughts. The second voice seemed to laugh. Then suddenly, the words and laughter disappeared beneath a distant but steady pressure against her mind. Setting her teeth, she pushed back against it. Dimly, she heard the voice laugh again at her efforts. And then with a suddenness that made her catch her breath, the pressure was gone. Are you all right? Skywalker's voice asked quietly. Mara looked down. Skywalker had risen up on one elbow, his silhouetted face turned toward her. Did you hear it too? she asked. I didn't hear any words, but I felt the pressure. Mara looked up toward the leaf canopy overhead. It's Zabaoth, she said. He's here. Yes, Skywalker said, and she could hear the apprehension in his voice. Small wonder he'd faced Zabaoth once back on Jomark and nearly lost out to him. So what now? Mara asked, rubbing at the sweat around her mouth with a shaking hand. We have bought the mission? The silhouette shrugged. How? We're only a couple of days from the mountain. It'd take us a lot longer than that to get back to the Falcon. Except that the Imperial's nowhere here now. Maybe, Skywalker said slowly. But maybe not. Did the contact cut off suddenly for you too? She frowned and suddenly it hit her. You think they moved some Salamiri around him? Or else strapped him into one of those frames you were using on Joe Mark, Skywalker said. Either way, it would imply he was a prisoner. Mara thought about that. If so, he might not be interested in telling his captors about the invaders moving toward the mountain. She looked sharply at him as another thought suddenly occurred to her. Did you know Sabaoth was going to come? She demanded. Is that why you wanted me to practice my old Jedi training? I didn't know he'd be here, Skywalker said, but I knew we would eventually have to face him again. He said that himself on Joe Mark. Mara shivered, kneeling at my feet. I don't want to face him, Skywalker. Neither do I, he said softly, but I think we have to. He sighed, and then quietly he peeled off the top of his bed roll and got to his feet. Why don't you go get some sleep, he said, stepping over to her side. I'm awake now anyway, and you took the brunt of that attack. All right, Mara said, too tired to argue. If you need any help, call me. I will. She picked her way across Kalrusian and the Wookiee to her bedroll and crawled into it. Her last memory, as she dropped off to sleep, was of the voice in the back of her mind. You will kill Luke Skywalker. The report came in from Mount Tantus during ship's night and was waiting for him when Peleon arrived on the bridge in the morning. The Draclaw had reached Wayland more or less on schedule six hours previously, had offloaded his passengers and had left the system bound for Valorar as per orders. General Covell had refused to take command until local morning. Peleon frowned. Refused to take command? That didn't sound like Covell. Captain Pleon, the comm officer called up to him. So we're getting a holo transmission from Colonel Sellard on Wayland. It's marked urgent. Put it through to the afterbridge hologram pod, Pleon instructed getting up from his command chair and heading aft. Signal the Grand Admiral to... Never mind. He interrupted himself as, through the archway, he spotted Thrawn and Rook coming up the steps into the aft bridge. Thrawn saw him too. What's wrong, Captain? Urgent message from Wayland, sir, Peleon said, gesturing toward the hologram pod. The image of an Imperial officer was already waiting, and even in a quarter-sized hollow, Peleon could see the younger man's nervousness. Probably Sibayoff, Thrawn predicted darkly. They reached position in front of the hologram pad, and Thrawn nodded to the image. Colonel Salad, this is Grand Admiral Thrawn. Report. Sir, Salad said, his parade ground posture stiffening even more. I regret to inform you, Admiral, of the sudden death of General Covell. Plan felt his mouth fall open a couple of centimetres. How? he asked. We don't know yet, sir, Salad said. He apparently died in his sleep. The medic is still running tests, but so far all they can suggest is that large portions of the General's brain had simply shut down. Brain tissue does not simply shut down, Colonel, Thrawn said. There has to be a reason for it. Salad seemed to wince. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir. I didn't mean it that way. I know you didn't, Thrawn assured him. What about the rest of the passengers? The medics are checking them all now, Salad said. No problem so far. Rather, they're checking all those still within the garrison. 
General Covell's troops, the company that arrived on the Drac War with him, had already been dispersed outside the mountain when he died. What, the whole company? Pleon asked. What for? I don't know, sir, Soward said. General Covell gave the orders, after the big, the big meeting, I mean before he died. Perhaps we'd better have the story from the beginning, Colonel. Thrawn cut him off. Tell me everything. Yes, sir, Soward visibly pulled himself together. General Covell and the others were landed via shuttle approximately six hours ago. Tried to turn over command of the garrison to him, but he refused. They insisted on having a private word of his troops in one of his of the officers' mess halls. Which troops? Thrawn asked. The whole garrison? No, sir, just the ones who accompanied him on the Dark Drac Law. He said he had some special orders to give them. Palaeon looked at Thrawn. I'd have thought he'd have had plenty of time aboard ship for special orders. Yes, Thrawn agreed. One would think so. Maybe it was Sabaoth's idea, sir, Salad suggested. He was the general side from the minute they got off the shuttle, muttering, sort of, the whole time. Was he now? Thrawn said thoughtfully. His voice was calm, but there was something beneath it that said to shiver up Palaeon's back. Where is Master Sabaoth now? Up in the Emperor's old royal chambers, Salad said. General Covell insisted they be opened for him. Would he be above the Asalamiri influence up there? Pleon murmured. Sh Fraun shook his head. I doubt it. According to my calculations, the entire mountain and some of the surrounding area should be within the force empty bubble. What happened then, Colonel? The general spent about fifteen minutes talking to his troops, Salad said. When he came out, he told me that he'd given them secret orders that had come directly from you, Admiral, and that I wasn't to interfere. And then they left the mountain. I was stripping one of the supply rooms full of old rooms of field gear and explosives, yes, Salad said. Actually, they spent a couple more hours inside the garrison before leaving, familiarizing themselves with the layout, the general said. After they left, Sabaoth escorted the general to his quarters, and then was himself escorted to the royal chambers by two of my stormtroopers. I put the rest of the garrison back onto standard nighttime routine, and that was it, until this morning when the orderly found it, the general... So, Sabaoth wasn't with Kavul at the time of his death? Veron asked. No, sir, Salad said. But the medics don't think the general lived very long after Sabaoth left him, and he was with the general up until that time. Yes, sir. Pleon threw Veron a sideways look. The Grand Admiral was staring at nothing, his glowing red eyes narrowed to slits. Tell me, Colonel, what was your impression of General Kavul? Well, Salad hesitated. I'd have to say I was a bit disappointed, sir. How so? He just wasn't what I was expecting, Admiral, Selad said, sounding distinctly uncomfortable. Pleon didn't blame him. Criticizing one senior officer in front of another was a serious breach of military etiquette, especially between different branches of the service. He seemed... Distant is the word I'd have to use, sir. He implied that my security was poor and that he would be making some important changes, but he wouldn't talk to me about them. In fact, he hardly spoke to me the whole time he was here. And it wasn't just me. He was short with the other officers who tried to talk to him as well. That was his privilege, of course, and he may have just been tired. But it didn't seem to fit with what I'd heard of the General's reputation. No, it doesn't, Thrawn said. Is the hologram pad in the Emperor's old throne room operational, Colonel? Yes, sir. Though Sabaoth may not be in the throne room itself, he will be, Thrawn said coldly. Connect me with him. Yes, sir. Selad's image vanished, replaced by the pause symbol. You think Sabaoth did something to Kovel? Pleon asked quietly. I see no other likely explanation, Thrawn said. My guess is that our beloved Jedi Master was trying to take over Kavul's mind, perhaps even replacing entire sections of it with his own. When they hit the Asalamir bubble and he lost that direct contact, there wasn't enough of Kavul left to keep him alive for long. I see. Plan turned his head away from the Grand Admiral, darkening anger flowing through him. He'd warned Thrawn about what Sabaoth might do, had warned him over and over again. What are you going to do about it? The poor symbol vanished before Thrawn could answer, but it wasn't the standard quarter-sized figure that replaced it. Instead, a huge image of Sabaoth's face suddenly glared out at them, jolting play on an involuntary step backwards. Thrawn didn't even twitch. "'Good morning, Master Sabaoth,' the Grand Admiral said, his voice mere smooth. "'I see you've discovered the Emperor's private hologram setting.' "'Grand Admiral Thrawn,' Sabaoth said, his own voice cold and arrogant. "'Is this how you reward my work on behalf of your ambitions? By an act of betrayal?' "'If there's betrayal, it's on your side, Master Sabaoth,' Thrawn said." What did you do to General Kavul? Sabaoth ignored the question. The force is not so easily betrayed as you think, he said. And never forget this, Grand Admiral Thrawn. With my destruction will come your own. I have foreseen it. He stopped, glaring back and forth at the two of them. For a handful of heartbeats, Thrawn remained silent. Are you finished? he asked at last. Sabaoth frowned, the play of uncertainty and nervousness easily visible in the magnified face. For all its intimidating majesty, the Empress' personal hologram setting clearly had its own set of drawbacks. For now, Sabaoth said. 
Have you some feeble defence to offer? I have nothing to defend, Master Sabaoth, Thrawn said. It was you who insisted on going to Wayland. Now tell me what you did to General Cobble. You will first restore the Force to me. The Salamiri will stay where they are, Thrawn said. Tell me what you did to General Cobble. For a moment the two men glared at each other. Sabaoth's glare crumbled first, and for a moment it looked as if he was going to fold. Then the old man's jaw jutted out, and once again he was the arrogant Jedi Master. General Cobble was mine to do with as I pleased, he said, as is everything in my empire. Thank you, Thrawn said. That's all I need to know. Colonel Salad. The huge face vanished and was replaced by Salad's quarter-sized image. Yes, Admiral? Instructions, Colonel, Thrawn told him. First of all, Master Sabaoth is hereby placed under arrest. You may allow him free run of the royal chambers and Emperor's throne room, but he is not to leave there. All control circuits from those floors will be disconnected, of course. Secondly, you are to initiate inquiries as to precisely where General Cobble's troops were seen within the mountain before they left. Why don't we ask the troops themselves, sir? Selad suggested. They presumably have comlinks with them, because I'm not certain we could trust their answers, Thrawn told him. Which brings me to my third order. None of the troops which left the mountain under General Cobble's orders are to be allowed back in. Selad's door dropped visibly. Sir, you heard correctly, Thrawn told him. Another transport will arrive for them in a few days, at which time they'll be rounded up and taken off the planet. But under no circumstance are they allowed to be are they to be allowed back into the mountain. Yes, sir, Selad said, floundering. But sir, what do I tell them? You may tell them the truth, Thrawn said quietly. That their orders came not from General Covell, and certainly not from me, but from a traitor to the Empire. Until intelligence can sort through the details, the entire company will be considered as under suspicion, as unwitting accomplices to treason. The words seemed to hang before them in the air. Understood, sir, Selad said at last. Good. Thrawn said. You are, of course, reinstated as garrison commander. Any questions? Sella drew himself up. No, sir. Good. Carry on, Colonel. Chimera out. The figure vanished from the hologram pod. Do you think it's safe to leave Sabaoth there, sir? Pleon asked. There's nowhere in the Empire safer, Thrawn pointed out. At least not yet. Pleon frowned. I don't understand. He is used to the Empire's rapidly nearing an end, Captain, Thrawn said, turning and walking beneath the archway in the main, the main section of the bridge. However, he still has one last role to play in our long-term consolidation of power. He paused at the aft edge of the command walkway. Sabaoth is insane, Captain. That we both agree on. But such insanity is in his mind, not in his body. Pleon stared at him. Are you suggesting we clone him? Why not? Thrawn asked. Not at Mount Tantus itself, certainly, given the conditions there. Most likely not at the speed which that facility allows either. That's all well and good for techs and TIE fighter pilots, but not a project of this delicacy. Now, I envision bringing such a clone to childhood and then allowing it to grow to maturity at a normal pace for its last 10 or 15 years, under suitable upbringing conditions, of course. I see, Leon said, struggling to keep his voice steady. Young Sabaoth, or maybe 2 or 10 or 20 of them, running loose around the galaxy. This was an idea that was going to take some getting used to. Where would you set up this other cloning facility? Somewhere absolutely secure, Thrawn said, possibly on one of the worlds in the Unknown Regions, where I once served the Emperor. You'll instruct intelligence to begin searching for a suitable location after you've crushed the rebels at Bilbringi. Pleon felt his lip twitch. Right, the dangerously ethereal Bilbringi attack. What with this Sabaoth thing, he'd almost forgotten the main business of the day, or his reservations concerning it. Yes, sir, Admiral. Uh, I'm, I'm forced to remind you that all the evidence still indicates Tangreen is the probable point of attack. I'm aware of the evidence, Captain, Thrawn said. Nevertheless, they will be at Bilbringi. He sent his gaze leisurely around his bridge, his glowing red eyes missing nothing, and the crews knew it. At every station from the crew pits to lateral consoles, there were the subtle sounds and movements of men aware that their commander was watching and striving to show him their best. And so will we, the Grand Admiral added to Leon. Set course for Bill Bringy, Captain, and let us prepare to meet our guests. Wedge drained the last of his cup and set it back on the chipped and stained wood of the small table, glancing across the noisy Mumbry store of cantina as he did so. The place was as crowded as it had been when he, Jansen, and Hobby had come in an hour earlier, but the texture of the crowd had changed quite a bit. Most of the younger people had left, couples and groups both, and had been replaced by an older and decidedly seedier looking bunch. The fringe types were drifting in, which meant it was time for them to be drifting out. His fellow rogue squadron pilots knew it too. Time to go, Hobby suggested, his voice just audible over the noise. Right, Wedge nodded, getting to his feet and fumbling in his pouch for a coin that would cover this last round. His civilian pouch, and he really hated the awkward things, but it would hardly do for them to go wandering around town in full New Republic uniforms, complete with the distinctive rogue squadron patches. He found a proper-sized coin and dropped it into the 
centre of the table as the other stood up. Where to now? Jansen asked, hunching his shoulders slightly to stretch out his back muscles. Back to the base, I think, Wedge told him. Good, Jansen grunted. Morning's going to come early enough as it is. Wedge nodded as he turned and headed toward the exit. Morning could come any time it wanted to, of course. Well before then, they were going to be off this planet and driving hard toward their assigned rendezvous point outside the Bilbringy shipyards. They wove their way between the crowded tables, and as they did so, a tall, thin man shoved his chair back almost into Wedge's knees and got unsteadily to his feet. Watch out, he slurred, half turning to throw his arm across Wedge's shoulders and much of his weight against Wedge's side. Easy, friend, Wedge grunted, struggling to regain his balance. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Jansen step to the tall man's other side and put a supporting arm around him. Easy sounds good to me, the man murmured. The slurring abruptly gone as his arm tightened around Wedge's shoulders. All four of us, nice and easy now. Let's help the poor old drunk out of here. Wedge stiffened, tracked, blindsided, and caught. And in the flip of an X-wing, they had suddenly gone from a simple night in the town to serious trouble. With him and Jansen tangled up like this, only Hobby was left of a clear gun hand, and their assailants surely hadn't forgotten to have some backup around. The tall man must have felt Wedge's tension. Hey, play it smooth, he admonished quietly. Don't remember me, huh? Wedge frowned at the face, practically leaning against his. It didn't look familiar, but on the other hand, at this range, he probably wouldn't recognize his own mother. Should I? He murmured back. The other did so. Did, the other did a little more staggering. I'd have thought so, he said in an injured voice. You go up against a star destroyer of someone here to remember you, especially out in the middle of nowhere. Wedge frowned a little harder at the face, dimly aware that the whole group had started walking in the middle of nowhere, and suddenly it hit him. The Katana fleet and Talon Card's people coming out of nowhere to lend their assistance and firepower against the Imperials. And afterwards, the brief preoccupied introductions about the Star Cruiser. Aves? That wasn't so hard, was it? The other said approvingly. Told you you couldn't do it if you tried. Come on now, nice and easy, and don't let's draw any more attention to ourselves than we need to. There didn't seem to be any real option other than to comply, but even as Wedge continued toward the exit, he kept his eyes moving, looking for something they could use to get them out of this. Card and his people had supposedly agreed to funnel information back to the New Republic, but that was a far way from being allies together. And if the Empire had threatened them, we just bought them outright. But no opportunity for escape presented itself before they got out the doors. This way, Ave said, abandoning his drunk act and hurrying down the dimly lit and sparsely populated street. Jansen caught Wedge's eye and raised his eyebrows questioningly. Wedge shrugged slightly in return and set off after Aves. It could still be some sort of trap, but at this point the vague fears were being rapidly overtaken by simple curiosity. Something was going on, and he wanted to find out what. He didn't have long to wonder about it. Two buildings drowned from the Mumbri stove. Aves turned and disappeared into a darkened entryway. Wedge followed, half expecting to run into a half dozen blaster muzzles. But Aves was alone. What now? he asked as Jansen and Hobie joined them. Aves nodded toward the street outside the entryway. Watch, he said. If I'm right, here he comes. Wedge looked. A walrus-faced aquilish strode quietly by, quickly by, throwing a quick glance into the entryway as he passed. His stride broke, just noticeably, then he caught himself and picked up his pace. He passed the other side of the entryway. There was a muffled thud, and suddenly the aquilish was back in the entryway, his slack and obviously unconscious form being supported by two grim-faced men. Any trouble? Aves asked. No, nah, one of the men said as they dropped the aquilish none too gently to the ground near the back of the entryway. They're a lot meaner than they are smart. This one was smart enough, Ave said. Take a good look at him, Antilles. Maybe next time you recognize an Imperial spy when you pick one up. Wedge looked down at the alien. An Imperial spy, huh? A freelancer, anyway, Ave shrugged. Just as dangerous. Wedge looked back at him, trying to keep his expression neutral. I suppose we ought to thank you, he said. One of the other men, busy searching the aquilish's clothing, snorted under his breath. I'd think you should, yeah? Ave said. If it hadn't been for us, he'd have been a juicy little item in the next Imperial Intelligence report. I suppose we would have, Wedge conceded, exchanging glances with Hobby and Jansen. But then that had been the idea of the whole charade, to do their bit to convince Grand Admiral Thrawn that Tangerine was still the New Republic's intended target. What are you going to do with him? He asked Aves. We'll take care of him, Ave said. Don't worry, he won't be making any reports any time soon. Wedge nodded. One evening, shot completely to Flinders. Still, it was nice to know Card's people were still on their side. Thanks again, he said. I meant it this time. I owe you one. Aves cocked his head. You want to pay off the debt right now? How? Wedge asked cautiously. I've got a little job in the works, Ave said, waving a hand vaguely toward the night sky. We know you do too. It would help a lot if we could time ours to go while you're keeping Thrawn occupied. Wedge frowned at him. What, you want me to tell you when our operation is starting? Why not? Ave said reasonably. Like I said, we already know it's in the works, but Libus's repeat performance and all that. 
Wedge looked at his pilots again, wondering if they appreciated the irony of this as much as he did. Here they stood, an evening's worth of subtle hints gone straight down the proton tubes, now they were being asked for an outright confirmation of the whole operation. Colonel Derland's decoy team couldn't have set things up better if they'd tried. I'm sorry, he said slowly, putting some genuine regret into his voice, but you know I can't tell you that. Why not? Aves asked patiently. Like I said, we already know most of it already. I can prove that if you want. Not here, Wedge said quickly. The goal was to plant hints, not to be so obvious that it aroused suspicion. Someone might hear you. Jansen tapped his arm. So we need to get back, he murmured. There's a lot of work yet to do before we leave. I know, I know, Wedge said. Good old Jansen, just the angle he'd been searching for. Look, Aves, I tell you what I'll do. Are you going to stick around here for a while? I could. Why? Let me talk to my unit commander, Wedge said. See if I can get a special clearance for you. Aves' expression showed pretty clearly what he thought of that idea. It's worth a try, he said diplomatically instead. How soon can you get an answer? I don't know, Wedge said. He's as busy as all the rest of us, you know. I'll try to get back to you one way or the other, but if you haven't learned from, heard from me in about 28 hours, don't expect to. Aves might have smiled slightly. Wedge couldn't tell in the dim light. All right, he said, grumbling a bit. I suppose it's better than nothing. You can leave any messages with the night bartender at the Dona Laza Tap Cafe. Okay, Wedge said. We've got to go. Thanks again. Together, he and the other two pilots left the entryway and crossed the street. They were two blocks away before Hobby spoke. Twenty-eight hours, huh? Pretty clever. I thought so. Wedge agreed modestly. Leaving here, then, would get us to Tangerine just about on time for the big battle. Let's just hope he's planning to sell that information to the Empire, Jansen murmured. He'd be ashamed to have wasted the whole evening. Oh, he'll sell it all right, Hobby snorted. He's a smuggler. What else would he want it for? Wedge fought back to the Katana battle. Maybe that was indeed all Card and his gang were fighting for, were <clears throat> fringe scum always for sale to the highest bidder, but somehow he didn't think so. We'll find out soon enough, he told Hobby. Come on, like Jansen said, we've got a lot of work to do. The last page scrolled across the display and stopped. Search summary ended. Next request? Cancel, Leia said, leaning back in her desk chair and looking out the window. Another dead end, just like the last one and the one before that. It was beginning to look like the research librarians had been right. If there was any information on the old Clone Wars cloning technique still in the old Senate library, it was buried away so deeply that no one would ever find it. Across the room, she caught a flicker of returning consciousness. Standing up, she crossed to the crib and looked down on her children. Jason was indeed awake, cooling to himself and making a serious effort to study his fingers. Beside him, Jaina was still asleep, her pudgy lips hanging open just enough to whistle softly with every breath. Hi there, Leia murmured to her son, picking him up out of the crib and cradling him in her arms. He looked up at her, her, his fingers momentarily forgotten, and smiled his wonderful toothless smile. Well, thank you, she said, smiling back and caressing his cheek. Come on, let's go see what's happening out in the big world. She carried him to the window. Beneath them, the Imperial City was in full mid-morning mayhem, with ground vehicles and airspeeders buzzing along in all directions like frantic insects. Beyond the city, the snow-tipped peaks of the Manarai Mountains to the south were dazzling in the morning sunshine. Beyond the mountains, the sky was a deep and cloudless blue, and beyond the sky, she shivered. Beyond the sky was a planetary energy shield, the Empire's invisible deadly asteroids. Jason gurgled. Leia looked back down at him, found him studying her for what she could almost imagine to be concern. It's all right, she assured him, holding him a little closer and bouncing him gently at her arms. It's all right. We'll find them all and get rid of them. Don't you worry. Behind her, the door opened and Winter came into the room, a half a tray floating along in front of her. Your Highness, she greeted Leia in a soft voice. I thought you might like some refreshment. Yes, I would, thank you, Leia said, sniffing at the gentle aroma of spiced paricha rising from the pot on the tray. Anything happening downstairs? Nothing interesting, Winter said, pushing the tray over to a side table and starting to unload it. The search teams haven't found any new asteroids since yesterday morning. I understand General Belliblis has been suggesting they may already have cleared them all out. I doubt Admiral Drayson believes that. No, Winter agreed holding out a steaming mug and waiting as Leia shifted Jason to a one-armed grip. Neither does Mon Mavma. Leia nodded as she accepted the mug. To be honest, she didn't really believe it herself. No matter how expensive these cloaking shields might be to produce, she couldn't see the Empire going to this much trouble for anything fewer than 70 cloaked asteroids. And there could easily be twice that many. The 21 they'd found hardly even scratched the surface. How is the research going? Winter asked, pouring a mug for herself. It's not, Leia had to admit. One insoluble problem to another, it seemed, but I don't know why that should surprise me. The Council Research Specialists have already been through all the records, and they didn't find anything. But you're a Jedi, Winter reminded her. You have the Force. Not enough of it, apparently. Leia shook her head. At least not enough to guide me to the right archive. If there is a right archive, I'm not sure anymore that there is. 
For a minute they sipped in silence. Leia savoured the soft flavour of the hot peri char, acutely aware that this could easily be her last taste of it for a while. All supplies of the route from which the drink was made had to be imported from off-planet. I was talking to Mob Fekar yesterday, Winter said into her thoughts. He said you'd spoken to him about a clue of some sort. Something that Mara Jade had said. Something that Mara said, coupled to something Luke did, Leia nodded. Yes, I remember. And I still think there's an important key in there somewhere. I just can't figure out what it is. At her wrist, her comlink beeped. I knew it couldn't last, Leia sighed, putting her mug down and pulling the comlink out. Mon Marvin had promised her a complete morning off. Obviously, that promise was about to be bent a little. Counselor Organa Solo? She said into the device. But it wasn't Mon Marvin. Counselor, this is Central Communications, a brisk military voice said. There's a civilian breeder called the Wild Carl holding position just outside the sentry line. The captain insists on speaking with you personally. Do you want to talk to him, or shall we just go ahead and chase him out of the system? So Card had finally come to pick up his people. Ross had been listening to rumors and had decided to poke around Coruscant a little for himself. Either way, it was trouble. Better let me talk to him, she told the controller. Yes, Counselor. There was a quiet click. Hello, Card, Leia said. This is Leia Organa Solo. Hello, Counselor, Card's cool, well-modulated voice replied. It's nice to talk to you again. I trust you received my package. Leia had to think back. Right, the macrobinocular record of the Yukio attack. Yes, we did, she acknowledged. Allow me to express the New Republic's gratitude. Your gratitude has already been amply expressed, Card said dryly. Were there any unpleasant repercussions over the payment arrangements? On the contrary, Leia said, bending the truth only a bit. We'd be happy to pay equivalent rates for more information of that quality. I'm glad to hear that, Card said. Are you by any chance also in the market for technology? Leia blinked. It wasn't a question she'd been expecting. What sort of technology? She asked. The semi-rare sort, he said. Why don't you give me clearance to come down and we'll discuss it? I'm afraid that won't be possible, Leia said. All non-essential traffic in and out of Coruscant has been restricted. Only the non-essential traffic? Leia grimaced. So he had been listening to rumours. What exactly have you heard? Assorted whispers only, he said. Only one of which really concerns me. Tell me about Mara. What about Mara? Leia asked guardedly. Is she under arrest? Leia threw a look at Winter. Card, this isn't something we should be discussing. Don't give me that. Card cut her off, his voice suddenly hard. You owe me. More to the point, you owe her. I'm aware of that, Leia countered, letting her own voice cool a degree or two. If you let me finish, this isn't something we should be discussing on an open channel. Ah, I see. If he was feeling any embarrassment over his mistake, it didn't show in his voice. Let's try this. Is Ghent available? He's around somewhere. Find him and get him on a terminal with comm system access. Tell him to program in one of my personal encrypt codes. His choice. That should give us enough privacy. Leia thought about it. Should at least filter out casual eavesdropping by other civilian ships in the system. Whether any Imperial probe droids lurking out there would be fooled was another question. It's a start, at least, she agreed. I'll go find him. I'll be waiting. The signal went silent. Trouble? Winter asked. Probably, Leia said. She looked down at Jason, a strange tingling in the back of her mind. There it was again, the eerie feeling that a vital piece of information was hovering in the darkness just out of reach. Luke and Mara were involved with it, she'd already decided. Could Card be involved too? He's come to plead Mara's case. I don't think he's going to be happy to find her gone. Take care of the twins, please. I have to find Ghent and get down to the war room. Her data check was ran to the end and stopped. Looks okay, Ghent told Leia, peering at the display and making one final adjustment to the encrypt scheme. You're not going to lose more than a syllable here or there anyway. Go ahead. Just be careful what you say, Belliblis reminded her. There could still be probe droids out there listening in, and there's no guarantee the Imperials haven't broken cards encrypt codes. Don't say anything they don't already know. I understand, Leia nodded. She sat down and tapped the switch under the comm officer indicated. We're ready here, Card. So am I, Card's voice came back. It sounded a bit halloween and pitched than normal, but otherwise seemed to be coming through fine. Why is Mara under arrest? There was a breaking in by an Imperial commando team a few weeks ago, Leia said, choosing her words carefully. The leader of the team implicated Mara as an accomplice. That's absurd, Card scoffed. I agree, Leia said, but an accusation like that has to be investigated. And what have your investigators discovered? What some of us already knew, Leia said, that she was once a member of the Emperor's personal staff. Is that why you're still holding her? Card demanded. For things she might or might not have done years ago? We're not worried about her past, Leia said, starting to sweat a little. She hated misleading Card this way, particularly after all the assistance he'd given them. But if there were probe droids listening, she needed to make it look like Mara was still under suspicion. Certain members of the Council and High Command are concerned about her current loyalties. And those members are fools, Card boot out. I'd like to talk with her. I'm afraid that's impossible, Leia said. She's not being allowed access to external communications. There's a faint sound from the speaker, an encrypt glitch or a sigh. Leia couldn't tell which. Tell me why I can't land, Card said. I've heard the rumours. Tell me the truth. 
Lay looked at the belly bliss. There was a sour look on his face, but he gave a reluctant nod. The truth is we're under siege, she told Card. The Grand Admiral has placed a large number of cloaked asteroids into orbit around Coruscant. We don't know where their orbits are, or even how many of them there are. Till we find and destroy all of them, the planetary shield has to stay up. Indeed, Card murmured. Interesting. I'd heard about the Empire's hidden fade, but there hasn't been anything at all about any asteroids. Most of the rumours have suggested merely that you'd suffered severe damage and were trying to cover it up. That sounds like the sort of story Fraun would circulate, Billy Bliss growled, a little jab at our morale to keep him amused between attacks. He's adept at all aspects of warfare, Card agreed. But to Leia's ear, there was something odd in his tone. How many of these asteroids have you found so far? I presume you've been looking. We found and destroyed 21, she told him. That's 22 gone, counting the one the Imperials destroyed to keep us from capturing it. But our battle data indicates he could have launched as many as 287. Card was silent a moment. That's still not all that many of the, for the volume of space involved. I'd be willing to risk coming through it. We're not worried about you, Billy Bliss put in. We're thinking of what would happen to Coruscant if a 40 meter asteroid got through the shield and hit the surface. I could make it through a f in for a five second gap, Card offered. We're not opening one, Leia said firmly. I'm sorry. There was another faint sound from the speaker. In that case, I suppose I have no choice but to make a deal. You said earlier that you'd be willing to pay for information. Very well. I have something you need, and my price is a few minutes of Mara. Leia frowned up at Bailey Bliss, got an equally puzzled look in return. Whatever Card was angling for, it wasn't obvious to him either. What was obvious was that she couldn't very well promise to let him talk to Mara. I can't make any promises, she told him. Tell me what the information is, and I'll try to be fair. There was a moment of silence as he fought it over. I suppose that's the best offer I'm going to get, he said at last. All right, you can lower your shield any time now. The asteroids are all gone. Leia stared at the speaker. What? You heard me, Card said. They're gone. Fraun left you 22. You've destroyed 22. The siege is over. How do you know? Billy Bliss asked. I said the bill brings you shipyards shortly before the Empire's hit and fade attack, Card told him. We observed a group of 22 asteroids being worked on under close security. At the time, of course, we didn't know what the Empire was doing with them. Did you make any records while you were there? Billy Bliss asked. I have the wildcard sensor data, he said. If you're ready, I'll drop it to you. Go ahead. The data feed light went on and Leia looked up at the matter visual dis master visual display. It was the inside of the Bill Bringji shipyards, all right. She recognized it from New Republic surveillance flights. And there in the center, surrounded by support craft and maintenance suited workers. He's right, Bill Lublis murmured. 22 of them. That doesn't prove there aren't any more, sir, the officer at the sensor console pointed out. They could have put another group together at... No, together another group at Ord Trasi or Yaga Minor. No, Bill Lublis shook his head. Aside from the logistics problems involved, I can't imagine Fraun spreading his cloaking technology around more than he has to. The last thing he can afford would be for us to get our hands on a working model, or even a systems readout, Card agreed. If he found a weakness, one of his chief advantages over you would be gone. All right, I've delivered on my end of the deal. How about yours? Leia looked at Bailey Bliss helplessly. Why do you want to talk with her? The general asked. If it matters, one of the hardest parts of being locked up is the feeling that you've been deserted, Card said coolly. I imagine Mara's feeling that. I know I did when I was Fraun's unwilling guest aboard the Chimera. I want to let her know, in person, that she hasn't been forgotten. Leia? Belibus murmured. What do we do? Leia stared at the general, hearing his words but not really registering them. There it was, right in front of her, the key she'd been searching for. Card's imprisonment aboard the Chimera. Leia? Belibus repeated, frowning. I heard you, she said, the words sounding distant and mechanical in her ears. Let him land. Belibus threw a glance at the deck officer. Perhaps we should. I said let him land. Leia snapped with more fire than she'd intended. Suddenly all the pieces had fallen into place, and the picture they formed was one of potential disaster. I'll take responsibility. For a moment, Bell Iblis studied her face. Card, this is Bell Iblis, he said slowly. We'll give you your five-second opening. Stand by for landing instructions. Thank you, Card said. I'll talk to you soon. Bell Iblis gestured to the deck officer, who nodded and got busy. All right, Leia, he said, turning back to her. What's going on? Leia took a deep breath. It's the cloning gun. I know how Fraun's growing, Fraun's growing them so fast. The whole war room had gone dead quiet. Tell me, Billy Bliss said. It's the Force, she told him. It was so obvious, so utterly obvious, and yet she missed it completely. Don't you see? When you make an exact duplicate of a sentient being, there's a natural resonance or something set up through the Force between that duplicate and the original. That's what warps the mind of a clone that's been grown too fast. There's not enough time for the mind to adapt to the pressure on it. You can't adjust, so it breaks. All right, Bella Bliss said dubiously. How is Fraun getting around the problem? It's very simple, Leia said, a shiver running through her. He's using Salamiri to block the force away from the cloning tanks. Bella Bliss's face went rigid. Across the silent war room, someone swore softly. It was Card's rescue from the Chimera that was the key, Leia went on. 
Mara told me that the Empire had taken five or six thousand Salamiri out of the forests on Mirka, but they weren't loading them onto their warships because when she and Luke went after Card, Luke had no problem using the Force because the Salamiri were on Wayland. Belibus nodded. He looked sharply at Leia, the texture of his sense abruptly changing, which means that when the team gets to the mountain, Luke will be helpless, Leia nodded, her throat tight, and he won't even suspect it until it's too late. She shivered again, the dream she'd had the night of the Imperial attack suddenly coming back to her, Luke and Mara facing a crazed Jedi and another unknown threat. She soothed herself at the time of the knowledge that Luke would be able to sense the Bayoff's presence on Wayland and take steps to avoid him, but with the Asalamiri there, he might walk right into the other's hands. No, would walk into Sabaoth's hands. Somehow at this instant she knew that he would. What she'd seen that night hadn't been a dream, but a Jedi vision. I'll talk to Mon Mothma, Belibus was saying, his face grim. Even if we'll bring even if we'll bring G, maybe we can shake some ships loose to go to their assistance. Turning he headed quickly toward the exit and the turbo lifts beyond it. For a moment Luke watched him, listening to as the war room broke its suppo elven post trance and came slowly back to life. He'd try, she knew, but she also knew he he would fail. Mon Mavma, Commander Sesfan, and Belibus himself had already said it. There simply weren't enough resources available to hit both Wayland and the Bilbringji shipyards at the same time, and she knew all too well that not everyone in the Council would believe that the threat of cloaked asteroids had ended, at least not enough to call off the Bilbringji attack, which meant there was exactly one person left who could go to the aid of her husband and brother. Taking a deep breath, Leia headed off after, headed off after Belibus. There was a great deal she had to do before Card arrived. There were three of them waiting when Card emerged from the ship, skulking beneath the canopy overhanging the paddock or sway tunnel. Card spotted them from the top of the wild card's entrance ramp, and despite the shadows, had two of them identified before he was halfway down. Leia Organa Solo was there, with Ghent fidgeting behind her. The third figure, standing behind both of the others, was short and wore the coarse brown robe of a Jawa. What a desert scavenger was doing there, Card couldn't guess. But as the group stepped out of the shadows toward him and he got his first good look at Organa Solo's face, it became clear that he was about to find out. Good morning, Counselor, he greeted her, inclining his head slightly. Good to see you, Ghent. I trust you've been making yourself useful. I suppose so, Ghent said, shifting nervously from one foot to the other, far too nervously, even for him. They say so, anyway. Good. Card shifted his attention to the third of the party. And your friend is? I am Mobfekar, Clan Hakar. A gravelly voice mewed. Card resisted the urge to take a half step backward. Whatever was hiding under that robe, it most certainly wasn't a Jawa. He's my bodyguard, Organa Solo said. Ah. With an effort, Card pulled his eyes away from whatever it was that was being concealed by the dark wood. Well, he said, waving a hand toward the excess way. Shall we go? Organa Solo shook her head. Mara's not here. Card threw a look at Ghent, who was looking even more uncomfortable. You told me she was. I only agreed if you that she'd been arrested, Organa Solo said. I couldn't say anything more then. There may have been Imperial probe droids listening in. With an effort, Card fought down his annoyance. They were all on the same side here, after all. Where is she? On a planet called Wayland, Organa Solo said, along with Luke and Han and some others. Wayland? Card couldn't recall ever hearing of that world before. What's on Wayland that they find so interesting? He asked. Grand Admiral Fawn's cloning facility. Card stared at her. You found it? We didn't, Organa Solo said. Mara did. Card nodded mechanically. So they'd found the cloning facility on their own. All that work he'd put in organising the other smuggler groups. Gone like dumped castle spies. The work, the risk, not to mention the money he'd planned to pay them with. You're certain the cloning facility is there? We'll find out soon enough, Organa Solo said, gesturing to the ship behind him. I need you to take me there, right away. Why? Because the expedition's in danger, Organa Solo said. They may not know it yet, but they are. And if they're still on the timetable we were sent, we have a chance of getting to them before it's too late. She told me all about it on the way up here, Gant added hesitantly. I think we ought to... He trailed off as Card sent a look his way. I sympathize with your people, Counselor, he said. But there are other matters that also need my attention. Then you abandon Mara, Organa Solo reminded him. I have no particular feelings for Mara, Card countered. She's a member of my organization. Nothing more. Isn't that enough? For a moment, Card gazed at her. She held his gaze evenly, calling his bluff. In her eyes, he could see that she knew perfectly well that it was a bluff. He couldn't simply walk away and abandon Mara to her death any more than he could abandon Aves or Dankin or Chin. Not if there was anything he could do to prevent it. It's not that easy, he said quietly. I have responsibilities to the rest of my people as well. At the moment, they're preparing to launch a raid with the hope of obtaining a crystal grab field trap to sell you. A flicker of surprise flashed across Organa Solo's face. A crystal grab field trap? It's not the one you're trying for. 
Card assured her, but we're scheduled up for the same time, hoping your attack will distract the enemy. I need to be there. I see, Organa Sola murmured, apparently deciding to pass over the question of how Card could have known about the Tan Green raid. Will the wild card make all that much difference in that raid? Card looked at Ghent. It wouldn't make any difference at all, not with Mazik and Ella and the others reinforcing the impressive group. Aves had already pulled together. The problem was that if they left now, and the way Organa Sola was talking, she meant for him to turn around and head straight back into space. There wouldn't be any chance of turning Ghent loose on the New Republic's computer system and rerouting the funds he needed to pay the other groups. Unless he could get the money another way. It can't be done, he told Organa Solo firmly. I can't simply walk out on my people. At least not without. Abruptly, the gyro-robed alien snapped his fingers. Card paused in mid-sentence, watching in fascination as the creature slipped noiselessly back into the Axis Sway tunnel, a slender knife appearing somehow in his hand. He disappeared through the door, and for a moment there was silence. Card raised his eyebrows at Organa Solo, got a slight shrug in return. There was a sudden squeal from inside the Axis Way door, followed by a sudden flurry of half-visible commotion. Card found his blaster in his hand and he was bringing it to bear on the figures, and all the activity abruptly stopped. A moment later, the alien reappeared, forcing a half-crouched figure before him. An all-too-familiar figure. Well, well, Card said, lowering his blast but not holstering it. Counselor failure, I believe. Reduced to eavesdropping at doorways. He is unarmed, the robed alien said in his gravelly voice. Release him, then, Organa Solo said. The alien complied. Thalia straightened up, his fur rippling madly across his head and torso as he tried to salvage what he could of his composure. I protest this improper treatment, he said, his voice somewhat less melodious than the boffin norm. I was not eavesdropping. General Bill Iblis informed me of Councillor Organa Solo's revelation concerning the cloning facility on Wayland. I came here, Captain Card, to urge you to assist Councillor Organa Solo in her wish to go to Wayland. Card smiled tightly. Where she would be conveniently out of your way? Thank you, but I believe we've already been through this together. The boffin drew himself up. This is not about politics. Without her warning, the team on Wayland may not survive. And without their survival, the Emperor's storehouse may not be destroyed before the Grand Admiral can remove some of its contents to a safe place. His violet eyes locked with cards, and that would be a disaster to both the Boffin people and to the galaxy. For a moment, Card studied him, wondering what was there that failure was so worried about. Some weapon or technology that Fraud hadn't found yet? Was it more unpersonal than that? Unpleasant or embarrassing information, perhaps, either about failure or the Boffin people generally? He didn't know, and he suspected failure wouldn't tell. But the particulars didn't really matter. Potential disasters to the Boffin people don't worry me, he told Phalia. How much do they worry you? There was an uncertain ripple of the fur across Phalia's shoulders. It would be a disaster for the galaxy as well, he said. So you said, Card agreed. I repeat, how much does it worry you? And this time Phalia got it. His eyes narrowed, his fur rippling with obvious contempt. How much worry will it take, he demanded. Nothing unreasonable, Card assured him. Merely a credit of, say, seventy thousand. Seventy thousand? Failia echoed, aghast. What exactly do you think? That's my price, Counselor. Card cut him off. Take it or leave it. And if Counselor Garna Solo is correct, we don't have time for any long discussions. Failure hissed like an angry predator. You are no better than a foul mercenary. He snarled, his voice about as vicious as Card had ever heard a boffin get. That you drain out the lifeblood of the boffin people. Spare me the lecture, Counselor, Card said. Yes or no? Failure hissed again. Yes. Good, Card nodded, looking at Organa Solo. Is the credit line your brother set up for me still there? Yes, she said. General Billibliss knows how to access it. You can deposit the 70,000 there, Card told Failure. And bear in mind that we'll be stopping to check on it before we reach Rayland, in case you had any thoughts about backing out. I am honourable smuggler, Failure snarled, unlike others present. I'm glad to hear that, Card said. Honourable beings are so difficult to find. Counselor Organa Solo? She took a deep breath. I'm ready, she said. They were off Coruscant and nearly ready for the jump to light speed, before Leia finally asked the question she'd worried about since coming aboard. Are we really going to stop to check on Failure's funds? With time as critical as you suggest? Card countered. Don't be silly. But Failure doesn't know that. Leia watched him for a moment as he handled the wild card's helm. The money's not really important to you, is it? Don't believe that either, he advised her coolly. I have certain obligations to meet. If Failure hadn't been willing to cooperate, your new Republic would have had to do so. I see, Leia murmured. He must have heard something in her voice. I mean that, he insisted, throwing a brief and entirely unconvincing scowl at her. I'm here because it suits my purposes, not for the sake of your war. I said I understood, Leia agreed, smiling privately to herself. The words were different, but the look on Card's face was almost identical. Look, I ain't in this for your revolution. I'm not in it for you, princess. I expect to be well paid. I'm in it for the money. 
Han had said that to her after that stormy escape from the first Death Star. At the time, she'd believed it. Her smile faded. He and Luke had saved her life then. She wondered if she'd be in time now to save theirs. The entrance to Mount Tantus was a glint of metal nestled cosily beneath an overhang of rock and vegetation. Between them and it, just visible from their hilltop vantage point, was a clearing of a small city lying in it. What do you think? Luke asked. I think we find another way in, Han told him, bracing his elbows a little harder than the, into the dead leaves and trying to hold the macro binocular steady. He'd been right. There was a stormtrooper guard station just off the metal doors. You never want the front door anyway. Luke tapped his shoulder twice. The signal that he'd picked up someone coming. Han froze, listening. Sure enough, there was a faint sound of clumping feet in the underbrush. A minute later, four Imperial troops in full field gear came out of the trees a few metres further down the hill. They walked straight past Han and Luke without so much as looking up, disappearing back into the trees a few steps later. Starting to get pretty thick, Han muttered. I think it's just a proximity to the mountain, Luke said. I still don't get any indication that they know we're out here. Han grunted and shifted his view to the village, perking out of the clearing down below them. Most of the buildings were squat, alien-looking things, of one really good-sized one facing into an open square. His angle wasn't all that good, but it looked like there were a bunch of sardans hanging around near the front of the big one. A town meeting, maybe? I didn't see any sign of a garrison down there, he said, sweeping the macro binoculars slowly across the village. Must be working directly out of the mountain. That should be make it easier to get around it. Yeah, Han said, frowning as he swung the macro binoculars back to the town square. That crowd of sardans he'd noticed a minute ago had shifted into a sort of semicircle now, facing a couple more of the walking rock piles, standing with their backs to the big building, and it was definitely getting bigger. Trouble? Luke murmured. I don't know, Han said slowly, wedging his elbows a little tighter and kicking the magnification up a notch. There's a big meeting going on down there. Two sardans, but they don't seem to be talking, just holding something. Let me try, Luke offered. There are Jedi techniques for enhancing vision. Maybe they'll work on a macro binocular image. Go ahead, Han said, handing over the macro binoculars and squinting at the sky. There were a few wispy clouds visible up there, but nothing that looked like it was going to become a general overcast any time soon. Figure two hours till sundown, another half hour of light after that. Hmm, Luke said. What is it? I'm not exactly sure, Luke said, lowering the macro binoculars, but it looks to me like what they're holding is a data pad. Han looked out toward the city. I didn't know they used data pads. Neither did I, Luke said, his voice suddenly going all strange. Han frowned at him. The kid was just staring at the mountain, a funny look in his face. What's wrong? It's the mountain, he said, staring hard at it. It's dark. All of it. Dark? Han frowned at the mountain. It looked fine to him. What are you talking about? It's dark, Luke repeated slowly, like Mirka was. Han looked at the mountain, looked back at Luke. You mean like in a bunch of your salamiri cutting off the force? Luke nodded. That's what it feels like. I won't know for sure until we're closer. Han looked back at the mountain, feeling his stomach curling up inside him. Great, he muttered. Just great. Now what? Luke shrugged. We go on. What else is there? Getting back to the Falcon and getting out of here, that's what, Han retorted. Unless you're really hot to walk into an Imperial trap. I don't think it's a trap, Luke said, shaking his head thoughtfully. Or at least not a trap for us. Remember how that contact I told you about with Sabaoth was suddenly cut off? Han rubbed his cheek. He could see what Luke was getting at, all right. The Asalamiri were here for Sabaoth, not him. I'm still not sure I buy that, he said. I thought Sabaoth and Fraun were on the same side. Mara said that herself. Maybe they had a falling out, Luke suggested. Maybe Fraun was using him from the start and now doesn't need him anymore. If the Imperials don't know we're here, the Asalamiri must have been meant for him. Yeah, well, it doesn't matter how much who they were meant for, Han pointed out. They'll block you just as well as they will Sabaoth. It'll be like Mirka all over again. Mara and I did okay on Mirka, Luke reminded him. We can handle it here. Anyway, we've come too far back now. now. Han grimaced, but the kid was right. Once the Empire gave up on this deserted planet routine, chances were the next New Republic team wouldn't even make it into the atmosphere. You going to tell Mara before we get there? Of course, Luke looked up at the sky, but I'll tell her on the way. We'd better get moving while we still have daylight. Right, Han said, giving the area one last look before he got to his feet. Force or no force, it was up to them. Let's go. The others are waiting just around the other side of the hill. How's it look? Lando asked as Han and Luke rejoined them. They still don't know we're here, Han told him, looking around for Mara. She was sitting on the ground near Freepio and Artu, concentrating on a set of five stones she'd gotten to hover in the air in front of her. 
Luke had been teaching her this kind of stuff for days, and Harden finally giving up trying to talk the kid out of it. It looked like the lessons are going to be a waste of time now, anyway. You ready to take us to this back door of yours? I'm ready to start looking for it, she said, still keeping the stones in the air. As I told you before, I only saw the air system equipment from inside the mountain. I never saw the intakes themselves. We'll find them, Luke assured her, passing Han and walking over to the droids. How are you doing, Freepio? Quite well, thank you, Master Luke, the droid answered primly. This route is so much better than many of the earlier ones. Beside him, Artu trilled something. Artu finds it so as well, Freepio added. Don't get attached to it, Mara warned, finally letting the stones drop as she stood up. There probably won't be any minor as she trails up the mountain for us to follow. The Empire discouraged native activity anywhere nearby. But don't worry, Luke soothed the droids. The Nograi will help us find a path. Free to Garrett's gold, you're cleared for final approach. The brisk voice of Bill Bringy Control came over the Everways bridge speaker. Docking platform 25. Straight vector is indicated to the bio. It'll feed you the course to follow the platform. Acknowledged, Control, Ave said, keying in the course that had come up on the nav display. What about the security fields? Stay on the course you're given and you won't run into them, the controller said. Deviate more than about 15 metres any direction you'll get a good bump on the nose. From the looks of it, I don't think your nose can afford any more bumps. Ave threw a glare at the speaker. One of these days he was going to get real tired of Imperial sarcasm. Thank you, he said, and keyed off. Imperials are such fun to work with, aren't they? Gillespie commented from the co-pilot station. I like to imagine what his expression is going to be like when we burn out of here if they're CGT, Ave said. Let's hope we're not around to find out for sure, Gillespie said. Pretty complicated fly system they've got here. It wasn't like this before that raid of Mazix, Ave said, gazing ahead through the viewport. Half a dozen shield generators are visible along his approach vector, floating loose around the area and defining the flight path the bayou would supposedly give him, probably supposed to keep anyone else from flying around the shipyards any old way they want to. Yeah, Gillespie said. I just hope they've got all the glitches out of the system. Me too, Aves agreed. I don't want them to know how much of a bump this ship can really take. Glanced down at his board, confirming his vector and then checking the time. The New Republic fleet ought to be hitting Tangreen in a little over three hours. Just enough time for the Eve way to dock, unload the specially tweaked tractor beam burst capacitors they were, courteously donating to the Empire's war effort, and get into backup position for Mazik's attempt to grab the CGT from the main command center eight docking platforms away. There goes Elor, Gillespie commented, nodding off the starboard. Aves looked. It was the Chimere, all right, with the... Clivering, running, and flanking position beside it. Beyond it, he could see the starry ice drifting in toward a docking platform near the perimeter. Near as he could tell, everything seemed to be falling into place. Though with someone like Thrawn in charge, appearances didn't mean much. For all he knew, the Grand Admiral might already know all about this raid, and was just waiting for everybody to sneak in under the net before wrapping it around them. You ever hear anything from Card? Gillespie asked a little too casually. He's not deserting us, Gillespie, Aves growled. If he says he has something more important to do, then he has something more important to do. Period. I know, Gillespie said, his voice noncommittal, just for some of the others might have asked. Aves grimaced. Here they went again. If they thought that opening up Ferrier's treachery at Hijana would have settled this whole thing once and for all, he should have known better. I'm here, he reminded Gillespie. So the Starry Ice, the Dawnbeat, the Last Resort, the Amanda Farlow, the... Yeah, right, I get the point, Gillespie interrupted. Don't get huffy at me. My ships are here too. Sorry, Ave said. I'm just getting tired of everybody always being so suspicious of everybody else. Gillespie shrugged. We're smugglers. We've had a lot of practice at it. Personally, I'm surprised the group's held together this long. What do you think he's doing? Who, Card? Ave shook his head. No idea. But it'll be something important. Sure, Gillespie pointed ahead. That the marker by you? Looks like it, Aves agreed. Get ready to copy the course data. Ready or not, here we go. The orders came up on Wedge's comm screen, and he gave them a quick check as he keyed for the squadron's private frequency. Rogue Squadron, this is Rogue Leader, he said. Orders, we're going in with the first wave, flanking Admiral Akbar's command cruiser. Hold position here until we are cleared for positioning. All ships acknowledge. The acknowledgements came in, crisp and firm, and Wedge smiled tightly to himself. There'd been some worry among Akbar's staff, he knew, that the long flight here to the rendezvous point might take the edge off those units that had first had to carry out decoy duty near the supposed Tangreen jump-off point. Wedge didn't know about the others, but it was clear that Rogue Squadron was primed and ready for battle. You suppose Fraun got our message, Rogue Leader? Jansen's voice came into Wedge's thoughts. Their message? All oh, right, that little conversation outside the Mumbri Storv canteen with Talon Card's friend Aves. One hobby had been firmly convinced would be going straight to Imperial Intelligence. I don't know, Rogue Five, Wedge told him. Actually, I sort of hope it didn't. Kind of a waste of time if it didn't. Not necessarily, Wedge pointed out. 
Remember, he said they had some other scheme online that they wanted to coordinate with ours. Anything that hits or distracts the Empire can't help but do us some good. They've probably just got some smuggling drop planned, Rogue Six sniffed, hoping to run it through while the Imperials are looking the other way. Wedged in reply, Luke Skywalker seemed to think Card was quietly on the New Republic side, and that was good enough for him, but there wasn't any way he was going to convince the rest of his squadron of that. Someday, maybe, Card would be willing to take a more open stand against the Empire. Until then, at least in Wedge's opinion, everyone who wasn't on the Grand Admiral's side was helping the New Republic whether they admitted it or not. Sometimes even whether they knew it or not. His comm display changed. The Vanguard cone of Star Cruisers had made it into their launch formation. Time for their escort ships to do the same. Okay, Rogue Squadron, he told the others. We've got the light. Let's get to our places. Easing power to his X-Wing's drive, he headed off toward the running lights ahead. Two and a half hours, if the rest of the fleet assembly stayed on schedule, and they'd be dropping out of light speed within spitting distance of the Bilbringji shipyards. A shame, he thought, for they wouldn't be able to see the looks on the Imperials' faces. The latest group of reports from the Tangerine region scrolled across the display. Pleon skimmed through them, scowling blackly to himself. No mistake, the rebels were still there, still slipping forces into the region, still doing nothing to draw attention to themselves. And in two hours, if intelligence's projections were even halfway accurate, they would be launching an attack on an effectively undefended system. They're doing quite well, aren't they, Captain? Thrawn commented from beside him. A very convincing performance all around. Sir, Pleon said, fighting to keep his voice properly deferential. I respectfully suggest that the rebel activity is not any kind of performance. The preponderance of evidence points to Tangreen as their probable target. Several key starfighter units and capital ships have clearly been assembled at likely jump-off points. Wrong, Captain. Thrawn cut him off coolly. That's what they want us to believe, but it's nothing more than a carefully constructed delusion. The ships you refer to pulled out of those sectors between 40 and 70 hours ago, leaving behind a few men with the proper uniforms and insignia to confuse our spies. The bulk of the force is even now on its way to Bill Bringji. Yes, sir, Pleon said with a silent sigh of defeat. So that was it. Once again, Thrawn had chosen to ignore his arguments, as well as all the evidence, in favour of nebulous hunches and intuitions. And if he was wrong, it wouldn't be simply the Tangreen ubiquitorate base that would be lost. An error of that magnitude would shake the confidence and momentum of the entire Imperial war machine. All war is risk, Captain, Thrawn said quietly. But this is not as large a risk as you seem to think. If I'm wrong, we lose one ubiquitorate base. Important, certainly, but hardly critical. He cocked a blue-black eyebrow. But if I'm right, we stand a good chance of destroying two entire rebel sector fleets. Consider the impact that will have on the current balance of power. Yes, sir, Pleon said dutifully. He could feel Thrawn's eyes on him. You don't have to believe, the Grand Admiral told him, but be prepared to be proved wrong. I very much hope so, sir, Pleon said. Good. Is my flagship ready, Captain? Pleon felt his back stiffen a bit in an old parade ground reflex. The Chimera is fully at your command, Admiral. And prepare the fleet for hyperspace, the glowing eyes glittered, and for battle. There are no real paths up Mount Tantus, but as Luke had predicted, the Nograi had a knack for terrain. They made remarkably good time, even if the droids slowing them down, and as the sun was disappearing below the trees, they reached the air intakes. It was not, however, exactly the way Luke had envisioned it. it looks more like a retractable turbo laser turret than an air system, he commented to Han as they moved cautiously through the trees toward the heavy metal mesh and the even heavier metal structure the mesh was set into. Reminds me of the bunker we had to break into on Endor, Han muttered back, except of a screen door. Easy. They might have intruder detectors. Anywhere else, Luke would have reached out into the tunnel with the Force. Here, in the Salamiri effect surrounding him, it was like being blind, like being on Mirka again. He looked at Mara, wondering if she was having similar thoughts and memories. Perhaps so. Even in the fading light, he could see the tension in her face, an anxiety and fear that hadn't been there before they entered the Salamiri bubble. So what now? She growled, flashing a brief glare at him before looking away again. We just sit around until morning? Han had his macro binoculars trained on the intake. Looks like a computer outlet there on the wall under the overhang, he said. The rest of you stay put. I'll take R2 over and try plugging him in. Beside Han, Chewbacca rumbled a warning. Where? Han muttered, drawing his blaster. The Wookiee pointed with one hand as he unlimbered his bowcaster with the other. The whole group froze, weapons ready, and it was then that Luke first heard the faint sounds of distant blaster fire. From several kilometres away, he fought, possibly somewhere down the mountain, but without his Jedi enhancement techniques, there was no way to know for sure. From much closer came a bird-like warbling. A group of Minerishi approach, Ekrikor said, listening intently to the signalling. The Nograi have stopped them. They wish to come forward and speak. Tell them to stay there, 
Han said, hesitating just a second before holstering his blaster. Pulling the bleached satin achaka claw bird out of a pocket of his jacket, he beckoned to Freepia. Come on, Goldenrod, let's go find out what they want. Eric Rikor muttered an order, and one of the Nograi moved silently to Han's side. Chewbacca stepped to the other side, and with a helplessly protesting Freepio trailing along, they head, all headed off into the trees. Artu gurgled uncomfortably, his dome head swiveling back and forth between Luke and the departing Freepio. He'll be alright, Luke assured him. Han won't let anything happen to him. The squat droid grunted, probably expressing his opinion of the depths of Han's concern for Freepio. He may have more problems with Free than Freepio's health to worry about in a minute, Lando said grimly. I thought I heard blaster fire from down the mountain. I did too, Mara nodded, probably coming from the storehouse entrance. Lando looked over his shoulder at the massive air intake. Let's see if we can get that vent open. At least it'll give us another direction to go if we need to jump. Luke looked at Mara, but she was avoiding his eyes again. All right, he told Lando. I'll go first. You bring R2. Cautiously, he moved through the trees toward the intakes, but if there were any anti-intruder defences, they didn't seem to be working anymore. He made it in under the metal overhang without incident, and with the wind of the inrushing air ruffling through his hair, he studied the mesh. At this distance, he could see that it was more like a heavy grating, with each strand of what had looked like mesh actually a plate extending several centimetres back into the tunnel. A formidable barrier, but nothing his lightsaber couldn't handle. There was the sound of a footstep through leaves, and he turned as Lando and R2 came up. The outlet's over there, R2, he told the droid, pointing to the socket in the side wall. Plug in and see what you can find out. The droid warbled acknowledgement, and with Lando's help, maneuvered his way across the rough ground. It's not just going to open up for you, Mara said from behind him. Artu's going to check it out, Luke told her, peering at her face. You all right? He'd expected a sarcastic comment, or at least a withering glare. He wasn't prepared for her to reach out and grip his hand. I want you to promise me something, she said in a low voice. Whatever it costs, don't let me go over to Sabaoth's side. You understand? Don't let me join him even if you have to kill me. Luke stared at her, an eerie chill running through him. Sabaoth can't force you to his side, Mara, he said. Not without your cooperation. Are you sure of that? Really sure? Luke grimaced. There was so much he didn't know yet about the Force. No. Neither am I, Mara said. That's what worries me. Sabaoth told me back on Joe Mark that I'd be joining him. He said it again here, too, the night he arrived. He may have been mistaken, Luke suggested hesitantly. Or lying. I don't want to risk it. She gripped Luke's hand tighter. I'm not going to serve him, Skywalker. I want you to promise that you'll kill me before you let him do that to me. Luke swallowed hard. Even without the Force, he could hear in her voice that she meant it. But for a Jedi to promise to cut someone down in cold blood, I'll promise you this, he said instead. Whatever happens in there, you won't have to face him alone. I'll be there to help you. She turned her face away. What if you're already dead? So it was down to this. The same battle she'd been fighting with herself since the day they met. You don't have to do it, he said quietly. The Emperor's dead. That voice you hear is just a memory he left behind inside you. I know that, she snapped, a touch of fire flickering through the cold dread. You think that makes it any easier to ignore? No, he conceded. But you can't use the voice as an excuse either. Your destiny is in your hands, Mara, not Sabaoth's or the Emperor's. In the end, you're the one who makes the decisions. You have that right, and that responsibility. From the forest came the sound of footsteps. Fine, Mara growled, dropping Luke's hand and taking a step back away from him. You spout philosophy if you want to. Just remember what I said. Spinning round, she turned to face the approaching group. So what's going on, Solo? We've picked up some allies, he said, throwing what looked like a frown in Luke's general direction. Sort of allies, anyway. Hey, Freepio, Lando called, waving to him. Come over here, will you, and tell me what R2's all excited about. Certainly, sir, Freepio said, shuffling over to the computer terminal. Luke looked back at Han. What do you mean, sort of allies? It's kind of confusing, Han said. At least the way Freepio translated it. They don't want to help us, they just want to go in and fight the Imperials. They followed us because they figured we'd find a back door they could get in through. Luke studied the group of silent, four-armed aliens towering over the Nograi guarding them. All wore four or more long knives and carried crossbows. Not exactly the sort of weapons to use against armored Imperial troops. I don't know. What do you think? Hey, Han, Lando called softly before Han could answer. Come here. You'll want to hear this. What? Han asked as they went over to the computer terminal. Tell them, Freepio, Lando said. Apparently there is an attack taking place at the main entrance to the mountain, Freepio said in that perennial surprised manner of his. Art, who has picked up several reports detailing perimeter guard troop movements into the area. Who is attacking? Han caught him off. Apparently some of the Sadans from the city, Freepio said. According to the gate reports, they demanded the release of their Lord Sabaoth before they attacked. Han looked at Luke. The data pad. Makes sense, Luke agreed. A message from Sabaoth inciting them to attack. I wonder how he managed to smuggle it out to them. 
Confirms he's been locked up anyway, Mara put in. I hope they've got some good guards on his cell. Pardon me, Master Luke, Freepio said, cocking his head to one side. But as to the data pad Captain Solo mentioned, I would suggest it arrived the same way the weapons did. According to reports, what kind of weapons? Han said. I was getting to that, sir, Freepio said, sounding a bit huffy. According to gate reports, the attackers are armed with blasters, portable missile launchers, and thermal detonators. All quite modern versions, if reports are to be believed. Never mind where they got them from, Lando said. The point is that we've got a custom cut diversion here. Let's use it while it's still there. Chewbacca rumbled suspiciously. You're right, pal, Han agreed, peering into the grating. It's awfully convenient timing. But Lando's right. We might as well go for it. Lando nodded. Okay, R2, shut it all down. The squat droid chirped acknowledgement, his computer arm rotating in the socket. The inflow of air across Luke's face began to decrease and a minute later had stopped completely. R2 warbled again. Our two reports that all operating systems for this intake have been shut down, Freepio announced. He warns, however, that once the duty cycle has ended, the dust barriers and driving fields may be reactivated from a central location. Better get moving, then, Luke said, igniting his lightsaber and stepping over to the intake. Four careful slices laid out they had their entrance. Looks clear, Han said, climbing gingerly through the opening, stepping over to the limited protection of the side wall. Got maintenance lights showing up down the tunnel a ways. R2, you get us any floor plans for this place? The droid jabbered as he rolled through the opening. I'm terribly sorry, sir, Freepio said. He has full schematics for the air duct system itself, but he says that further information on the facility was not available at this terminal. There'll be other terminals down the line, Lando said. Are we leaving a rear guard? One of the Nogri will stay. Ekrikor mewed at Han's elbow. He will keep the exit clear. Fine, Han said. Let's go. They were 50 meters down the tunnel and approaching the first of the dim maintenance lights. Han had spotted before Luke suddenly noticed that the silent... Minero she had followed them in. Han, he murmured, gesturing behind them. Yeah, I know, Han said. What did you want me to do? Tell them to go home? Luke looked back again. He was right, of course. But knives and crossbows against blasters? Ekricor, what is your command, son of Vader? I want you to assign two of your people to go off those Minero she, he told the Nograi. They're to guide them and help them with their attacks. But it is you we must protect, son of Vader. Ekricor objected. You will be protecting me, Luke said. Every Imperial the Minerishi can pin down will be one less for us to worry about, but they can't pin any troops down if they're killed in the first sortie. The Nogra made an unhappy sounding noise in the back of his throat. I hear and obey, he said reluctantly. He gestured to two of the Nogra, and as Luke watched them drop back down the tunnel, he caught a quick look at Mara's face as she passed one of the lights. The dread was still there, but along with it was a grim determination. Whatever was waiting ahead for them, she was ready to face it. He could only hope that he was, too. There it is, Card announced, pointing ahead to the mountain rising out of the forest in the gathering shadows of twilight. You sure? Leia asked, stretching out of the force as hard as she could. Back at Bespin, during that mad escape from Lando's cloud city, she'd been able to sense Luke's call from almost this far away. Here now, there was nothing at all. That's where their nav feed seems to be leading us, Card told her. Must have seen through Ghent's little deception and are sending us to some sort of decoy spot. He glanced over his shoulder at her. Anything? No. Leia looked out at the mountain, her stomach tightening painfully. After all their hopes and effort, they were too late. They must already be inside. They're heading into trouble then, Ghent spoke up from the comm station where he was still fiddling with the fine-tuning on his counterfeit Imperial ID code. Flight control says they've got a riot going on at the entrance. They're diverting us to a secondary maintenance area about 10 kilometers north. Leia shook her head. We're going to have to risk contacting them. Too dangerous, Duncan, the co-pilot said. If they catch us using a non-Imperial comlink channel, we're likely to get shot down. Perhaps there is another way, Bob Vekar said, moving to Leia's side. Ekricor clan Bakhtor will have left a guard at their entrance point. There is a Nograi recognition signal that can be created with landing lights. Go ahead, Card said. We can always claim a malfunction if the garrison notices. Chin, Corvus, watch your scopes. Stepping over to Dankin's board, Venogra keyed the landing lights on and off a half dozen times. Leia stared out the viewport, trying to watch the whole mountain at once. If Han and the others had gone in above the dusk line. Got it. Corvus's voice came from his turbo laser turret, bearing 003 Mark 17. Leia looked over Card's shoulder as the coordinates came up on his nav display. There it was, faint but visible, a flickering light. They are there. Mob Vicar confirmed. Good, Card said. Can't acknowledge that we're proceeding to that secondary maintenance area is ordered. Better find a seat and strap down, counselor. We're about to have an unexpected repulsor lift malfunction. Between the trees and eroded rock outcroppings, it looked to Leia like an impossible place for a ship the size of the wild card to land. But Card and his crew had clearly pulled this trick before, and with the last second sputter of precision aimed turbo laser fire, they created just enough of a gap to put down into. 
Now what? Duncan asked as Card cycled back the repulsive lifts. Card looked at Leia, raised an eyebrow in question. I'm going in, Leia told him. The vision of Luke and Mara in danger hovering before her eyes. You don't have to come along. The council and I will go look for her friends. Card answered Duncan, unstrapping and getting to his feet. Kent, you'll try to convince the garrison that we don't need any assistance. What about me? Duncan asked. Card smiled tightly. You'll stay ready in case they don't believe him. Come on, counselor. The Nogra had returned their signals nowhere inside as he as they stepped out onto the wild card's ramp. Where is he? Card asked, looking around. Waiting, while Bebekar said, putting a hand to the side of his mouth and giving a complex whistle. An answering whistle came, shifted into a complete, complex warble. Our identity is confirmed, he said. He bids us come quickly. The others are no more than a quarter hour ahead. A quarter hour. Leia stared out at the starlit darkness of the mountain. Too late to warn them, but maybe not too late to help. Come on, we're wasting time, she said. Just a minute, Card said, looking past her shoulder. We have to wait for... Ah, Leia turned. Coming down the corridor toward them from the aft section of the ship was a middle-aged man with a pair of long-legged quadruped animals in tow. Here you go, Captain, the man said, holding out the leashes. Thank you, Chin, Card said, taking them as he squatted down to scratch both animals briefly behind the ears. I don't believe you've met my pet Vaughn Skears, Counselor. This one's named Drang, the somewhat more aloof one there is Sturm. On Mirka, they use the force to hunt their prey. Here, they're going to use it to find Mara. Right? The Vaughnskis made a strange sound, rather like a cackling purr. Good, Card said, strengthening up again. I believe we're ready now. Counselor, shall we go? The alarms are still hooting in the distance as Han carefully leaned one eye around the corner. According to the floor plans R2 had pulled up, this should be the major outer defense monitor station in this sector of the garrison. There were likely to be guards, and those guards were likely to be alert. He was right on both counts. Five meters away down the entry corridor, flanking a heavy blast door, stood a pair of stormtroopers. They were alert enough to notice a skulking stranger looking at them and to snap their blaster rifles up into firing position. The smart thing to do, the thing any reasonably non-suicidal person would do, would be to duck back behind the corner before the shooting started. Instead, Han gripped the corner with his free hand, using the leverage to throw himself completely across the entry corridor. He made it to the other side millimeters ahead of the tracking blaster bolts, flattening himself against the wall as the rapid fire blew out chunks of paneling metal behind him. It was still firing as Chewbacca leaned around the corner Han had just left and ended the discussion with two quick bowcaster shots. Good job, Chewie, Han grunted, throwing a quick look behind him and then slipping back around the corner. The stormtroopers are out of the fight, all right, leaving nothing in their way but a massive metal door, which, like the stormtroopers themselves, was no big deal, at least not for them. Ready? he asked, dropping into a half crouch at one side of the door and raising his blaster. There would be another pair of guards inside. Ready, Luke confirmed. There was the snap hiss of the kid's lightsaber, and the brilliant green blade whipped past Han's head to slice horizontally through the heavy metal of the blast door. Somewhere along the way, it caught the internal release mechanism, and as Luke finished the cart, the top part of the door shot up along its track into the ceiling. From the way the stormtroopers are facing the door, it was clear they'd heard the short fight outside. It was also clear that they hadn't expected anyone to be coming through this soon. Han shot one of them as he tried to bring his blaster rifle to bear. Luke lunged half over the bottom part of the door, lightsaber swinging, and took out the other. The group of Imperials manning their sensor consoles weren't expecting company either. They were fumbling for sidearms and scrambling for cover as Han and Chewbacca took them out. A dozen shots after that, the room had been reduced to a smoldering collection of junk. That ought to do it, Han decided. Better get lost before the reinforcements get here. But between the riot down at the main entrance and the wandering band of... Min Erishi Imperial response time was down. The free intruders made it back along the corridor to the emergency stairway, and three levels down to the pump room where they'd left the others. Two of the Nogra were standing silent guard just inside the door as Han keyed it open. Any trouble? Lander called from somewhere in the tangle of pipes that seemed to fill two thirds of the room. Not really, Han said as Chewbacca closed and locked the door behind them. Won't want to try it again, though. Lando grunted. I don't think you'll have to. They should be adequately convinced that there's a major aerial attack on the way. Let's hope so, Han said, stepping around to where Lando was fiddling with an archaic-looking control board. Artu was plugged into a computer socket on the side of the board, while Freepio hovered off to the side like a nervous mother bird. Vintage stuff, huh? You've got that, Lando agreed. I think the Emperor must have just picked up the cloning complex and dropped it in here whole. Artu gibbered indignantly. Right, including the programming, Lando said dryly. I know a little about this stuff, Han, but not enough to do any permanent damage. I think we're going to have to use the explosives. Fine with me, Han said. He would have hated lucking them all the way across Wayland for nothing anyway. Where's Mara? Out there, Lando said, nodding toward another door half hidden by the pipes. In the main room. Let's check it out, Luke, Han said. He didn't like the idea of Mara wandering around alone in this place. Should we stay here with Lando? See if there's anything worth blowing up. 
Crossing to the door, he keyed it open. Beyond was a wide circular walkway running around the inside of what seemed to be a huge natural cavern. Directly ahead, framed against a massive equipment column that extended downward from the ceiling through the center of the cavern, Mara was standing at the walkway's railing. This the place? he asked her, glancing around as he started toward her. About twenty other doors opened up onto the walkway at more or less regular intervals, and there were four retractable bridges extending out to a work platform encircling the central equipment column. Aside from a couple of their nograis skulking around doing guard duty, there was no one else in sight, but there were sounds. A muted hum of machinery and voices was, was coming from somewhere, punctuated by the faint clicks of relays and a strange rhythmic pulsing or whooshing sound, like the whole cavern was breathing. It's the place, Mara confirmed, her voice sounding strange. Maybe she thought it sounded like breathing too. Come and see. Han threw a glance at Luke, and together they stopped to Mara's side and looked down over the wailing. And it was indeed the place. The cavern was huge, extending downward at least ten stories beyond their walkway. It was laid out like a sport arena, with each level being a kind of circular balcony running around the inside of the cavern. Each balcony was a little wider than the one above it, extending further into the center of the cavern and making for a smaller hole around the big equipment column. There were pipes everywhere, huge ones coming off the ducts of the central column, smaller ones running around the edges of each of the balconies, and little ones feeding off them into the neatly arranged metal circles that filled the balconies and main floor. Thousands of little circles, each one the top cover plate of a sparty cloning cylinder. Beside Han, Luke made a strange sound in the back of his throat. It's hard to believe, he said, sounding about halfway between awestruck and dumbfounded. Believe it, Han advised him grimly, pulling out his macro binoculars and focusing them on the main floor below. The ductwork blocked a lot of the view, but he could catch glimpses of men in medtech and guard uniforms were scurrying around. They were on some of the balconies too. They're stirred up like a rat's nest down there, he said. Stormtroopers on the main floor and everything. He threw a sideways look at Mara. Her expression was tight as she stared down at the cloning tanks, with the haunted look of someone gazing back into the past. Bring back memories? he asked. Yes, she said mechanically. She stood there in a, a moment longer, then slowly straightened up. But we can't allow it to stand. Glad you agree, Han said, studying her face. She looked and sounded okay now, but there was a lot of stuff going on under the surface. Hold it together, kid, he told her silently. Just a little longer, okay? That column in the middle looks like our best shot. You know anything about it? She looked across the cavern. Not really, she hesitated, but there might be another way. The Emperor wasn't one for leaving things behind for other people to use. Not if he could help it. Han for a glance at Luke. You mean this whole place might have a self-destruct? It's possible, she said, that haunted look back in her eyes again. If so, the control will be up in the throne room. I could go and take a look. I don't know, Han said, looking down into the cloning cavern. It was an awfully big place for them to take on of a single sack of explosives. You'd give her that much. A destruct switch would simplify things a lot, but the idea of Mara and her memories up there in the Emperor's throne room didn't sound so good either. Thanks, but I don't think any of us ought to go wandering around this place alone. I'll go with her, Luke volunteered. She's right. It's worth checking out. It'll be safe enough, Mara added. There's a service droid turbo lift along the walkover that'll get us most of the way there. Most of the Imperial's attention should be focused on the riot at the entrance anyway. Han grimaced. All right, get going, he growled. Don't forget to let us know before you pull the switch, okay? We won't, Luke assured him with a tight grin. Come on, Mara. They headed down the walkway. Where are they going? Lando asked from behind Han. Emperor's throne room, Han said. She thinks he might have put a self-destruct switch up there. You find anything? Ardu's finally got a connection into the main computer, Lando told him. He's looking for schematics of that thing, he gestured toward the central column. We can't wait, Han decided, turning back as Chewbacca emerged from the pump room with their bag of explosives over one shoulder. Chewie, you and Lando take one of those bridges across and get busy. Right, Lando said, taking a cautious look over the railing. What about you? I'm going to go lock us in, Han told him, pointing to the other doors opening out onto the walkway. You, Nograi, come here. The two Nograi had been standing guard moved silently to him as Lando and Chewbacca headed toward the nearest bridge. Your command, Han Clan Solo? One of them asked. You? Stay here, he told the nearest one. Watch for trouble. You, he pointed to the other. Help me seal off those doors. One good blast shot into each control box ought to do it. I'll go this way, you go the other. He's about two thirds of the way around his side of the walkway. He heard something over the eerie mechanical breathing sounds of the cavern below him. Looking back, he saw Freepio calling and beckoning to him from the pump room door. Great, he muttered. Leave it to Freepio, and sooner or later he'd make a mess of it. Finishing the door he was on, he turned and hurried back. Captain Solo, Freepio gushed in relief as Han came up to him. Thank the maker. R2 says, what are you trying to do? Han snapped. Bring the whole garrison down on us? Of course not, sir. But R2 says, you wanted to talk to me, you come out and find me, right? Yes, sir, but R2 says, if you don't know where to look, you use your comlink, Han said. 
jabbing a finger at the little cylinder the droid was clutching. That's why you've got one. You don't just shout around. You got that? Yes, sir, Freepio said, his mechanical patience sounding more than a little strained. May I continue? Han sighed. So much for the lecture. He'd do better talking to a banfa. Yeah, what is it? It's about Master Luke, Freepio said. I overheard one of the Nograi say that he and Mara Jade were on their way to the Emperor's throne room. Yeah, so? Well, sir, in the course of his inquiries, R2 has just learned that the Jedi Master Jorah Sebeoff is imprisoned in that area. Han stared at him. What do you mean, that area? Isn't he in the detention center? No, sir, Freepio said. As I said, why didn't you say so? Han demanded, yanking out his comm link and thumbing it on. And just as the fast... Just as fast thumbing it off. The comm links appear to be inoperable, Freepio said primly. I discovered that when I attempted to contact you. Great, Han snarled. The burst of jamming static still echoing in his ears as he looked around. Luke and Mara walking right into Sabaoth's arms. And no way to warn them. No way except one. Keep R2 busy looking for those schematics, he told Freepio, shoving the comm link back into his belt. While he's at it, tell him to see if he can find out where the jamming is coming from. If he can, send a couple of the Nograi to try and get rid of it. Then get out to that work platform until Chewie and Lando where I've gone. Yes, sir, Freepio said, sounding a little surprised by the flurry of orders and command authority. Pardon me, sir, but where will you have gone? Where do you think? Han retorted over his shoulder as he started down the walkway. It never failed, he thought sourly. One way or the other, no matter where they were, what they were doing, somehow he always wound up chasing off after Luke. And it was starting to look more and more like a good thing he'd come along. All right, Garrett's gold. Hatchways here are sealed, the controller's voice said. Stand by to receive outbound course data. Acknowledged control, Ave said, easing the either way back from the docking arm and starting a leisurely turn. They were ready here, and from the looks of things, so was everyone else. There he is, Gillespie muttered, pointing out the viewport. Right on schedule. You sure that's Mazik? Aves asked, peering out at the ship. Pretty sure, Gillespie said. Want me to try giving him a call? Aves shrugged, looking around the shipyards. They'd set up the rest of the group with a good encrypt code, but it wouldn't be a smart idea to tempt trouble by using it before they had to. Let's hold off a minute, he told Gillespie. Wait until we've got something to talk about. The words were barely out of his mouth when the whole thing went straight to hell. Star Destroyers, Fawn barked from the comm console. Coming in from light speed. Vectors? Gillespie snapped. Don't bother, Aves told him, a cold knife twisting in his gut. He could see the Star Destroyers ahead, all right, appearing out of hyperspace at the edge of the shipyards, and the Dreadnoughts, and the Lancer Frigates, and the Strike Cruisers, and the Tire Squadrons. A complete assault fleet, and then some. And practically every fighting ship of Card's Smuggle Confederation was here, right in the middle of it. So it was a trap, Gillespie said, his voice icy calm. I guess so, Aves said, staring up at the Armada still moving into formation. A formation that seemed wrong somehow. Aves Gillespie, this is Mazik. The other smuggler's voice came over the comm. Looks like we've been sold out after all. I'm not going to surrender. How about you? I think they deserve to lose at least a couple of Star Destroyers for this, Gillespie agreed. That was my idea, Mazik said. Too bad Card isn't here to see us go out in a blaze of glory. He paused and Aves could feel Gillespie's and Fawn's eyes on him. They would, he knew, go to their desk believing Card had betrayed them. All of them would. I'm with you too, he told the others quietly. If you want Mazik, you can have command. Thanks, Mazik said. I was going to take it anyway. Stand by. We might as well deliver our first punch together. Aves took one last look at the armada and suddenly he had it. Hold it, he snapped. Mazik, everyone, hold it. That assault force isn't here for us. What are you talking about, Gillespie demanded. Those interdictor cruisers out there, Aves said. Out past that Star Destroyer group. See them? Look at their positioning. There was a moment of silence. Mazik got it first. That's not an enclosure configuration, he said. You're right, it's not, Gillespie agreed. Look, you can see a second group of them farther back. It's an entrapment configuration, Mazik said, sounding like he didn't believe his own words. They're setting up to pull someone out of hyperspace and then keep him here long enough to pound him. Aves looked at Gillespie, found him looking back. No, Gillespie breathed. You don't suppose? I thought they were supposed to be hitting Tangreen. So did I, Aves told him grimly, the twisting knife back in his gut. I guess we were wrong. Where else Fraun is? Gillespie looked out at the Almadar and shook his head. No, probably not. All right, let's not panic, Mazik said. If the New Republic comes, it just means that much more to occupy the Imperial's attention. Let's stay on schedule and see what happens. Right, Aves sighed. Square in the middle of an Imperial base during a New Republic attack. Terrific. Tell you something, Aves, Gillespie commented. If we get out of this, I'm going to have to have some words with your boss. No argument, Aves looked out at Fraun's armada. Matter of fact, I think maybe I'll go with you. Carefully, Mara eased her head out of the emergency stairway and took a look into the corridor beyond. The caution was wasted. This level was as deserted as the three below it had been. All clear, she murmured, stepping out into the corridor. No guards here either. 
Skywalker asked, looking around as he joined her. No point to it, she told him. Except for the throne room and the royal chambers, there was never much of anything on these top levels. I guess there still isn't. Where's his private turbo lift? To the right and around that corner, she said, pointing with her blaster. More from habit than any real need, she tried to keep her footsteps quiet as she led the way down the corridor. She reached the cross corridor and turned into it. Fair ten metres dead ahead, two stormtroopers stood flanking the turbo lift door, their blaster rifles already lifting the track toward her. Half a step into the corridor, all the momentum going the wrong direction, there was no way for Mara to go but down. She dived for the deck, firing toward them as she fell. One of the stormtroopers toppled back as a burst of flame erupted in his chest armour. The second rifle swung toward her face and jerked reflexively away as Skywalker's lightsaber came spinning down the corridor toward him. Didn't do any real damage, of course, at that distance and without the force, Skywalker wasn't that good a shot, but it did a fine job of distracting the stormtrooper, and that was all Mara needed. Even as the Imperial ducked away from the whirling blade, she caught him with two clean shots. He hit the deck and stayed there. I guess I don't want anyone going in there, Skywalker said, coming up beside her. I guess not, Mara agreed, ignoring the hand he offered and getting up on her own. Come on. The turbo lift car had been locked at this level, but it took Mara only a minute to release it. There were only four stops listed, the one they were on, the emergency shuttle hangar, the royal chambers, and the throne room itself. She keyed for the last, and the door slid shut behind them. The trip upward was a short one, and a few seconds later, the door on the opposite side of the car slid open. Bracing herself, Mara stepped out, into the Empress throne room, and into a flood of memories. It was all here just as she remembered it. The muted side lights and brooding darkness the Emperor had found so conductive, conducive to meditation and thought. The raised section of floor at the far end of the chamber, allowing him to look down from his throne as visitors climbed the staircase into his presence. View screens on the walls on either side of the throne, darkened now, which enabled him to keep track of the details of his domain, and for an overview of that domain. She turned to her left, gazing over the railing of the walkway into the huge open space that faced the throne. Floating there in the darkness, a blaze of light twenty metres across, was the galaxy. Not the standard galaxy hologram any school or shipping business might own, not even the more precise versions that could be found only in the war rooms of select sector military headquarters. This hologram was sculpted in exquisite and absolutely unique detail, with a single accurately positioned spot of light for each of the galaxy's hundred billion stars. Political regions were delineated by subtle encirclements of colour, the core systems, the outer rim territories, wild space, the unknown regions. From his throne, the Emperor could manipulate the image, highlighting a chosen sector, locating a single system, or tracking a military campaign. It was as much a work of art as it was a tool. Grand Admiral Thrawn would love it. And with that thought, the memories of the past faded reluctantly into the realities of the present. Thrawn was in command now, a man who wanted to recreate the Empire in his own image, wanted it badly enough to unleash a new round of Clone Wars if that would gain it for him. She took a deep breath. All right, she said. The words echoed around the chamber, pushing the memory still further away. If it's here, it'll be built into the throne. With an obvious effort, Skywalker pulled his gaze away from the hologram galaxy. Let's take a look. They headed down the 10 meter walkway that led from the turbo lift into the main part of the throne room, walking beneath the overhead catwalk that ran across the front edge of the hologram pit and between the raised guard platforms flanking the stairway. Mara glanced at the platforms as she and Skywalker walked up the steps to the upper level, remembering the red-cloaked Imperial guards who had once stood there in silent watchfulness. Beneath the upper level floor, visible between the steps as they climbed, the Emperor's monitor and control area was dark and silent. Aside from the galaxy hologram, all of the systems up here appeared to have been shut down. They reached the top of the steps and headed across toward the throne itself, turned away from them toward the polished rock wall behind it. Mara was looking at it, wondering why the Emperor had left it facing away from his galaxy when it began to turn around. She grabbed Skywalker's arm, snapping her blaster up to point at the throne. The massive chair completed its turn. So at last you have come to me, Dura Sabaoth said, gravely, gazing out at them from the depths of the throne. I knew you would. Together we will teach the galaxy what it means to serve the Jedi.